1999, and he claimed that he have a very genuine reforms. In the same time, what happens in 2011 with the crackdown after the uprising started and all huge and grave human rights violation occurred. And we can see that yet Bahrain is started in darkness more and more day by day through all these types of the human rights violation, starting killing the streets and military intervention by Saudi Arabia, then later on and detention of all prison or all opposition leaders and banning freedom of expression, valuing freedom of assembly, then later on led to the total political isolation where all political parties are being banned. In the same way, we can see that all type of the human rights violations, uh, execution started, uh, stripping of nationality, and even uh, um, uh, unlawful uh, exportation of the citizens abroad. Uh, all that's in one hand, but at the same time, we can hear daily that there are some international allies of Bahrain, unfortunately, UK, United States, United Kingdom, are claiming that Bahrain is in right track. So today, all together, we want to analyze all these claims. At the same time, we want to find out, is it really Bahrain is in the right track? And at the same time, we want to evaluate that what all the parties, especially oppositions, what they want to say, especially NGOs, what they want to re re reveal. And then in and then, then the meanwhile, all the activists in Bahrain, how they see the, uh, the claim of the reforms or what or their views toward the reforms in Bahrain, if there are gonna be any. So what is gonna be the roadmap toward the reforms in Bahrain? And unfortunately, as we know, the majority of the opposition leaders are behind the bar, they are sentenced uh, to life. Many of them are given their clear indications at that they are willing to find out and the, the truth way for stability and security of the, of, of the, of the government and the, the, the country only if such um, uh, rights of the people toward the, 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 the democratic states will be reserved. And here we have many, many our um, uh, uh, colleagues that uh, joining us from Bahrain, they're gonna participate to us. So welcome everyone. And I am happy to be with you today. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Joanne. So without further ado, we'll get started with our first session, which is a roundtable conversation. Um, again, my name is Dr. Stacy Strobel. I'm from Shenandoah University in Virginia in the United States, uh, author of Sectarian Order in Bahrain, The Social and Colonial Origins of Criminal Justice, uh, published in 2018. Um, but I have the good fortune today of being a listener and uh, to continue to learn. I am I'm a, a lifelong student of Bahrain and its political and social uh, challenges. Um, and I look forward to this wonderful panel discussion as we really um, take a deep dive into many of, of the issues of political reform. Um, as a quick note, we did reach out to um, representatives of the Bahrain government to represent uh, its viewpoint, um, but they were uh, not um, willing to participate. We also reached out to others that that may have a um, pro-government position and they also declined. Um, so we just point that out. So we're left uh, in our session to interpret um, what may be the Bahrain government's uh, intentions for the upcoming election um, through its behavior and remarks that are in the public domain. Uh, but without further ado, we have an amazing panel here. I mean, I can't tell you how blessed we are uh, to have the expertise the, and the experience um, of these folks. And so I'll introduce um, them and then we will begin to um, start our discussion um, format here. So first we have Ali Aswad, he's a civil engineer. Uh, he's a former member of parliament representing the Al-Wafaq party. Um, and he has worked in the political departments and director of the office of the Se secretary general for that political party. I'm also delighted to introduce Saeed Al-Shahabi, a very prominent opposition figure uh, whose nationality has unfortunately also been revoked. 
Um, and so he continues his political activism in the diaspora. He um, is, uh, has written some very, very important articles uh, on, on Bahrain and his forthrightness um, and, and courage that he has shown in this regard are, are amazing. Uh, we also have Tara O'Grady, a member of Salam uh, for Democracy and Human Rights Advisory Board. She has expertise regarding nonviolent civil society mobilization, advocacy, and facilitating all inclusive negotiations. She is a tireless human rights defender, uh, and so we're really uh, fortunate to be hearing from her today. We also have Nicolo Figatalamanca. He is the Secretary General of the organization No Peace Without Justice. He has led large scale human rights uh, campaigns and humanitarian law operations in conflict and post conflict environments. So he'll be turning a close eye with us uh, to Bahrain. Uh, and finally, we have Sana Al Sargali, who is a professor of constitutional law at Al Najah University in Palestine. She is emerging as one of the foremost constitutional scholars of the MENA region and from the MENA region. Uh, and she is co-founder and director of the Constitutional Studies Center at Al Najah University. And so without further ado, I think I'd like to start uh, with uh, Dr. Al Shahabi. Um, so from your perspective, um, what do you make of, of Bahrain's uh, vision for public participation in next year's elections? Do you, do you think that um, there will be a chance for um, some of the currently barred political parties to participate? <clears throat> Thanks, Stacey, for this uh, kind introduction. And it is my pleasure to be with you today, uh, listening uh, and participating with my colleagues uh, and uh, probably the people from Bahrain who are with me uh, have suffered more than myself. Uh, almost all of them uh, were, went to jail or in prison uh, at one stage or another in their lives. So <clears throat> they have sacrificed a lot. And if, uh, if we put the question to them later, uh, you will see their answers. But my answer is that uh, I think the regime may, at the end, under pressure from the United States, from uh, from uh, from UK, they may allow some members of the of the of the opposition political societies uh, to participate. They may allow some. Uh, I don't want to say, but uh, probably rogue members who would uh, defy the orders from their leadership to take uh, part in the elections. But whatever happens, it is not going to change the, the fundamental facts of the situation. There are facts on the ground. We have uh, currently about 1,500 political prisoners. We did have uh, throughout this crisis for in the past 10 years, more than 20, 25,000 political prisoners uh, who had saved their sentences and they are starting to come out after serving uh, their sentences. We are not like Kuwait who had given par uh, amnesty to the to its prisoners or to Oman who uh, who also released their political detainees. We are not used to this kind of treatment by this regime. Uh, we are only uh, experiencing harshness cruelty from this uh, uh, regime. So what's going to happen in the next year's elections is not clear. And I hope our, uh, the political societies will not uh, participate unless the, all the, the demands are met, which is almost impossible for the demands to be met by the regime. And of course, we, I belong to, uh, to the groups who totally reject uh, the elections and do not believe that our experiences with those elections have been useful or fruitful, and that it will be just a waste of time. And it, it could only, in our belief, it will only whitewash or a window screen. Uh, well, it's all, only try to, it will, it will only uh, help to uh, show a different face of an, a cruel regime. So we do not believe that being inside, as Al-Wafaq has experienced, being inside the, the this uh, election elected or so, sort of elected body 
is going to be useful. They couldn't do anything. And this is why they withdrew at the end. And nothing has changed. No improvement, no reform of this institution has taken place. So it's yes, a futile exercise. Yes, um, it seems to be that that the situation is is quite dire. I want to get Ali Aswad uh, remarks on this as well. What do you, what do you think the the prospect is for political participation in the coming year? Ali, I have to unmute myself. Hi, um, okay. hello to everyone. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to for this discussion today. It just. Uh, if I would go back to 2011 and highlight on those eight points or areas for discussions, uh, the political parties started with the governments or with the authority represented by the Crown Prince at that time, where it was about the governments that reflects the will of people or an elected parliament with full powers, fairly distributed voting constituencies, separating of judiciary, addressing political naturalizations, competing financials and administrative corruption, halting the privatization of states' properties, stopping the infl inflammation of sectarianism. I mean, some of these points, if you go back to 1920s also, you will see, you will see the, same, the, same, the same thing here, uh, the same demands from the Bahrainis where it will ring the bell here, whether the, this authority or the governments or regime or family in Bahrain have a will of implementing a reform in our country, yes or no? That's a big question. Whether the opposition being in the parliament or opposition being in the street, demanding loudly, having uh, the support from international community, discussing this with the uh, uh, probably friends of Bahrain authority like United Kingdom, United States. I personally don't think this family or governments would like to give from their power to the people. So they choose the unity of family rather than unity of the Bahrain. This is, this is something very, very important where we need to discuss maybe today also. Uh, I've seen your questions about what is the Bahraini perspective in terms of, you know, uh, participating in the election in 2022. It means, to us, it means nothing. To the opposition in Bahrain, it means nothing. To the, uh, those, uh, you know, supporters to the opposition also, it means nothing because there is no room, there is no place where they have their votes on. They're, they cannot say anything. And the way exit from this, it's just not being negative, maybe just trying to think forwards, the way being, the way exit from this is to have the dialogue with the governments. The governments, they don't want the dialogue. They don't want to talk to the opposition. So we both parties are stuck now. We talk in the media, we, they talk in the media, and uh, in the end, the Bahraini people, they are suffering, whether they are 1500s or 1400s political prisoners or even one uh, political prisoners. We still think the people rights in Bahrain to be out from these jails. The people rights is to get released. That's number one. And we have a couple of ideas, like, you know, as an opposition to get uh, to solve this uh, uh, crisis or problem in Bahrain. The, the things here, Bahrain is getting more support from their allies, inter international allies, strategic allies, United Kingdom, United States, uh, European Union also. Sometimes we think some of European unions, they are supporting Bahraini as a Bahrain supporting the principle, yes. But when it comes to... Uh, the deals when it comes to business, we, we just seen like, you know, two weeks ago, German governments closed the deals with the Bahraini, increasing the amount of deals with the Bahraini authorities. And that will not support Bahraini. That will not help the Bahrain, you know, to, to move forward from this political crisis. Yes, we have yes, electricity. Yes, I see what you mean there. And I wanted to get um, Tara O'Grady um, to maybe weigh in a little bit about sort of what we're seeing from, because both uh, you and, and Syed have mentioned uh, the importance of United States and, and European allies. And I'm just wondering, Tara, what are you seeing in terms of the, the levels of support coming from those quarters? Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Can I just check yes. that you can hear me okay? Yep. Um, well, in... March of 2017, Trump lifted the condition that Bahrain must improve its human rights record to buy F-16 fighters. And in 2018, Bahrain was elected to the Human Rights Council by the UN General Assembly. In January of this year, 
President Trump designated Bahrain as a major security partner following August 2020 at the Abraham Accords in the June of this year, that year, the king appointed the first ambassador to Israel. So they've been developing and coaxing um, significant relationships over the last few years and furthering uh, dissent and fomenting problems inside the country by continuing to hold on to the political prisoners. While they continue to do that, it is absolutely impossible for there to be a fair election because the majority of people who should be considered for political roles continue to be imprisoned. Um, so I really don't have very much faith in um, the system changing unless they take that critical step to release political prisoners. And political prisoners are not just Shia prisoners. There are prisoners from all backgrounds. They have um, put out the hand over the last few months and uh, released prisoners for this alternative sentencing initiative. But the majority of those prisoners, the vast majority of them were petty criminals uh, or blue collar criminals, uh, perhaps in um, there for drugs or uh, prostitution and that kind of racketeering. But people who are political dissidents and opponents have not been um, largely have not been released. And those that have been released are gagged completely. They have um, no possibility of speaking or particip participation because remember that it is illegal for those who've done over six months in prison, remembering that King Hamid often jails his opponents to stand in elections. So that rules out um, the majority of our opposition, really. Yes. Uh, wow. So I want to get Niccolo uh, in on this this piece here about sort of the what I'm hearing is the criminalization of political participation when it's it's from an opposition um, sort of space. Um, and and how how does that sort of square with with what you see in general in, in human rights violations around the world? Is this particularly egregious? Uh, hi, and thank you, first of all, for uh, for having me. Um, Bahrain is, is a little bit of a special case. Uh, we don't just have an authoritarian regime. Uh, we have uh, one which is ruled by a family that somehow believes uh, not only it is legitimate forever, but somewhat also the owners of the country. I mean, they call themselves the conquerors. They, in a way, admit that uh, uh, by, by their very name, they give themselves that they, they, they have come and conquered something and, and, and they own it. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about uh, uh, political reform, when we talk about uh, uh, movement or transition to, to democracy, we have to, we have to frame it in, in a way that uh, uh, we have to understand that this is, is not just about giving it uh, power away, uh, to others within the elite or within the, the, the political class. Uh, somehow, uh, for the ruling family, this is giving away their, their uh, birthright, mm -hmm. their, their, uh, their heritage, uh, and what they own as, as a family, as if, it, as, if it, as, if it was, as if it was somewhat private property. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is, this is an important uh, element also um, to 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 understand uh, when when we're talking about uh, transparency and economic reform and corruption, there is no corruption from their point of view in Bahrain because they own Bahrain. Yeah. So it's not like uh, the, anybody else is is uh, entitled to have a say in, in in something that they believe it's simply their private property. So, you know, where there is a, the structure of a daula, the structure of a state conceptually exists in terms of a framework, uh, in reality, this is just for them part of the private, corporate owned, privately owned structure. Uh, and I, I think it's a. It belongs a, to them. Yes. From that point yeah. of view. And this, I, think it's a, I think it's important to see this because then how to read the developments and the challenges to, to the ownership. I mean, basically, those who are asking for civil and political rights, those who are asking for participations, are people who are encroaching into the private property. 
And right, and, right. and I'm going to interrupt you really quickly because I want to make sure we get everybody in. Um, I think you're making a really good point about the perception of, of the government that it somehow owns or this belongs to them as a family or as a tribe. Um, but hypothetically, it's a constitutional monarchy, right? And so I want to get um, Dr. Officer Harley to tell us a little bit about the work that she has done sort of trying to look at what is the constitutional framework and, and, and frankly, how is it failing um, in this case? Well, thank you very much, uh, Stacy, for having me and, uh, and everybody and thanks for the nice introduction. Um, so basically, uh, when I did my work on Bahrain, and I have to say, I always say um, it's up to Bahrainis to decide how they want their constitution, um, you know, to be drafted or how they want it to, to look like. Well, unfortunately, um, the Bahraini constitution gives um, great space for the ruling family or the king to do whatever um, he wants. And I think this, this phrase, um, the protector of the constitution is the king. It's, it's one of the, the, you know, the outdated ways of, of looking um, at the rule of, of the monarchy or what the king, um, you know, has to do. So before talking about how it's failing, I have to say that in Bahrain, before going to elections or making uh, any kind of uh, movement in, in that way, I think the constitutional order should change totally, because at the current, you know, at the current stage, you have a constitution that gives legitimacy uh, to the king to do whatever he pleases. So even if we look at the, the COVID-19 response, right, and we were talking about the state of emergency and why it was not declared and the exceptional powers that the, the king has and, you know, like uh, the, the, the prime minister, it was all constitutional because of the gaps that the current uh, Bahraini constitution has. So in Bahrain, it was always um, a kind of uh, top-down process. It was never involving the people of Bahrain, even with the uh, National Action Charter. Uh, you know, it was, in my opinion, it was kind of um, cosmetic uh, change. Uh, it was not really something uh, that helped Bahraini to be involved. And I... And I was wondering when I looked at Bahrain, um, uh, what this constitution serve, right? What, why it's still in action with all the activism that takes place. And I would agree with the, with the previous speaker that if elections take place, uh, maybe the oppositions won't really care about it. Why? Because if you still have the same constitutional order, nothing will change. You still have the same uh, council, you will still have the what council and even with the constitution where any kind of amendments for it you need the approval of the total um, you know like uh, house not each i think this is uh, you know a major problem um, so in my work uh, in bahrain i think the first step that should be done is constitutional reform but i don't mean constitution making because constitution making maybe would repeat 2002 problems I think at the moment in Bahrain, you need constitutional building a process. And maybe uh, this is the, the, the rule of the grassroots movements, uh, NGOs, uh, human rights advocates, um, universities. Um, they, they should work on constitutional building a process where you should have this commitment of constitutionalism. You should have the ethos for constitutionalism. But again, this could be pure theoretical approach because I don't know if this would actually work. In order to put the regime on the stake and say, let's do real changes, this should take uh, place first, the constitutional building process, and to try to advocate for participation. It could take one year, two years, three years, five years, but at least you are building something that is a bit different from um, the current situation that we have. I will stop here in order to add, because I was listening to what everybody's saying, and I put some notes, so I would like to jump in at the end uh, to add more notes about it. That sounds great. What do, what do other folks um, think about the role of the Constitution in either creating the problem or pre presenting an avenue for some kind of solution? Go ahead, Ali. What do you, what do you think? I mean, just first of all, I would like to add here one thing from Bahrain Constitutions 2002. It gives the king the power to do everything in the state, to do everything, like 28 powers he had in the Constitutions. 
from appointing the prime minister, dismiss the, uh, the council, the, the parliament, appoint the shura members, and also appointing a directors in the in the governments within the governments do everything like you know it's all in one hand all these powers so this constitution basically it won't work for the near future or if it stays as it is without a real reform for constitution we are not seeing as an opposition any light in the dark to move forward that's what i want to add to uh, what sana said uh, Thank you. Saeed, what do you think about the constitutional dimension to this? Well, Ali has just uh, mentioned a few points, who, and I think he is right. Uh, the, we had a constitution. Imagine we had a reasonable re constitution that we participated in drafting in 1972-73. And that one is just very similar to the Kuwaiti one. And Kuwait has been living almost, almost quietly for the past 50 years. Uh, while Bahrain has been uh, going from one phase of uh, trouble and instability to another, because we, they abandoned, they abrogated that constitution in 2002, and they replaced it with, with this present constitution that was tailor-made to suit the requirements and the needs of the uh, of the ruler and his family, so you cannot build a, a, sta a modern statehood uh, unilaterally. You have to have multilateral approach to running a modern statehood. With uh, in the, this is not the case in in Bahrain. So senior figures uh, like Sheikh Isa Qasim has recently uh, said that we need to rewrite to redraft a new constitution. Uh, and I'm sure most people in Bahrain would like to have their own input into a constitution that rules uh, them. Uh, with, because we may talk about the human rights, we may, uh, the Human Rights Council may intervene, some UN experts may say something, but the human rights can never be secured under dictatorship. At the present, we have absolute dictatorship. No dictator in the world respects human rights. So whatever we do, it's a futile exercise to work on human rights improvement in Bahrain because it will never work. It will never improve. Uh, so constitutionalism is the word to a new uh, to a, to a new era in the country, and without it, we'll just continue to stay where we are. Thank you. Um, and we do have another uh, person on our panel that I want to work in here. Um, we have Ibrahim Sharif, who is also a prominent opposition political activist. And we're so, so glad that he's here with us. He's currently serving um, as the General Secretary of the National Democratic Action Society. Ibrahim, we're hearing um, a sense of despair here, I think, um, that anything might change. I'm wondering what your perspective is on how much hope we can have um, that elections uh, next year and or constitutional reform is possible. Thank you, Stacey. Uh, um, just to correct, uh, I am not the head of the uh, National Democratic Action Society. It was dissolved a few years back. Uh, I am an ex, ex, ex head. Uh, there were two other heads after me. And, uh, uh, and she, uh, Stacey shouldn't have given you the chance to speak because you are not allowed to speak. <laughs> yesterday there was supposed to be a, a seminar in which he was supposed to speak they cancelled it so i don't know thank right. you Stacey, for allowing him to be very careful everything is criminalized in bahrain today if you say an illegal constitution you could go to jail if you say repressive state you could go to jail if you say sectarian regime you could go to jail if you if you if you uh, say your point of view about the war in yemen about one sisterly states around us you could go to jail if you say down to al bashir you could go to jail i was sentenced to 6 months uh, uh, jail sentence just for saying al bashir you should go you should go you are you are a despot uh, al bashir umar al bashir so, so it is, uh, it is uh, you know, it's a situation where, uh, you know, when we speak, uh, this is why we don't appear so much in public, uh, uh, to avoid these situations where we say exactly what we think. But I think we are, I am in front of an intelligent panel that knows 
uh, how to uh, basically parse my words in their own way. The, uh, the uh, inertia that we have right now is that of the maximum pressure uh, policy that the government followed after uh, 2014. You know, we have two waves of repression. One started in 2011. I'm talking about the last 10 years uh, with the, uh, the spring of Bahrain, uh, February 14th. And the other, then uh, the, uh, the commission for the, uh, uh, the investigation, uh, the independent commission came and there was sort of a lull. There was sort of, uh, you know, reduced uh, uh, violence and reduced repression for some times. This started again in a big way uh, at the end of uh, 2014, when the societies decided to boycott to 2014. And then Sheikh Ali Salman uh, uh, was put to jail and then further another jail sentence for, uh, you know, claiming that he was uh, sort of uh, cooperating with the Qataris. Uh, the, uh, so we are in that phase and we are still not over that phase. Thousands of people were put in jail after 2014. We still have 1,000 plus in jail. We have probably a thousand, around a thousand who have been, you know, close to a thousand who have been released with alternative sentencing. That means they practically have no right to speak uh, or they will be threatened again uh, to jail. Uh, so we are in this maximum pressure period. I mean, uh, as testimony of that, as Dr. Saeed said last night, I was supposed to have an economic lecture about the, the economic reforms that proposed by the government. And it was banned. Although I can appear in, in social media and I don't know who thinks and who uh, plan for the government, uh, I can appear in, in social media and say exactly what I was going to say yesterday, probably with a bigger audience. And I have no problem with that. But to do that in, uh, you know, in the walls of a society where I will have to be actually a little more, more careful not to hurt them, I am banned. This is very funny uh, uh, situation. And I'm not banned by law because there is no such law. I'm banned by the fact that they are the law, basically. Uh, so go I on. wanted to um, jump in here and, and, and sort of um, sort of move us towards sort of thinking about what we can do in the next year, given that there's this maximum political pressure that you point to, that there's criminalization, um, that there's this 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 authoritarian uh, situation. Um, Niccolo or, or Tara, what are some of the campaigns, strategies that could be brought to bear? And, and what we're seeing here is quite a difficult situation. Niccolo, please, you go first. Thank you. Um, well, the point is, what will, what will address the imbalance of power? Because uh, ultimately, um, the, it is a question of power. It is a question of control. It is a question of who decides. Uh, and uh, the ruling family wants to be able to be the ones who decides. So uh, when I hear uh, Dr. Shahabi say it's useless to work on human rights, it's true, it's also useless to work on constitution. It's useless to work on participation unless it's a way to exercise a weight on a lever that can somehow unhinge that monopoly of power. Now, uh, what the Bahrainis uh, regime uh, wants and needs is uh, international legitimacy. Uh, it, uh, it wants it and needs it more or less depending on the vagaries of, uh, of regional dynamics, in particular, uh, the good relationships uh, uh, with and between uh, UAE and, uh, and, and Saudi. It wants it and needs it also, depending on how it wants to feel about itself. And the whole uh, Royal Commission exercise, um, independent uh, uh, only in, uh, in uh, its investigation, certainly not in its conclusions, uh, was uh, about how the Bahraini regime wanted to project itself to the world. So uh, that is something that there can be leverage on, and that is something that uh, many of the people in, that I see in this panel have been tirelessly working on, simply to denounce uh, 
the fakeness of the image uh, the brain wants to project to the world. Now, denunciation for denunciation is not useful. Denunciation for the purposes of changing political dynamics can be useful. And this is why um, the investment in uh, uh, the exposing, unmasking the regime and its rhetoric, uh, both uh, in wanting to appear like a, a human rights uh, democracy example in the, in the region, in the sub-region, uh, and in terms of what it's doing to its own population is important because you cannot let them win the appearances battle abroad, which is a battle that at home they've already lost, but they still want to win it abroad. And that is an important source of leverage. What does it mean in practice? Will it make life better on the population? I don't know, but for sure it's something they care about. And for sure, this is something that every time we are able to get uh, the European Parliament to say something, the High Commission to say something, it's, it's a little bit chipping away to the diamond, uh, brilliant, uh, shiny image uh, that they would like uh, they would like to project. And that is certainly worth something, not just for solidarity for the prisoners, uh, which is important on a personal level, but also for the legitimacy uh, of their power. If their power is legitimate, uh, because they, it is because they won the public relations, the appearances war. We cannot let that happen. At home, it doesn't happen. Everybody knows that this is a, it's a, it's a dictatorial autocratic regime. But abroad, they're still trying to project a different image. Tara? Sure. Uh, thanks very much for giving me the floor. I appreciate it. Um, I'm from a country that was born through revolution, and I'm proud that my family fought for independence. And we really regret that the Northern Territory Ulster continues to be subjects of the colonial power um, Britain and the, headed by a monarch. But we had an opportunity to negotiate back then in uh, 100 years ago. And through that negotiation, Northern Ireland has, uh, there's less blood on the street, basically. And I think that we feel for Bahrain as another small island nation, because they are gripped in this claw of a monarch who is absolutely refusing to permit uh, participation in politics or in power to give any agency to any of the opposition, regardless of whether they are Shia or Sunni. In fact, the Bahraini people that I know consider themselves, many of them sushi, which is both. Two words that came to me this week that I learned this week. One was uh, malversation, which is the corrupt administration of power and a cacistocracy, which is government by the worst people. And unfortunately, given this tremendous uh, academic uh, research that's been done over the last 10 years that I've been involved with Bahrain. Um, they really seem to epitomize those uh, two words. There is the argument that the Crown Prince has been open to reform and cooperation and that Al-Wafak should take a step towards government, potentially re-register and try to stand for election, and that Bahrain has also implemented alternative sentencing. These arguments there are out there. However, this has proven to be no more than a confidence building measure for international optics, as Niccolo said. And we believe that the government is not interested in true political reform. However, I can say that I'm outside the country and I can say those things. But I've been reading this book. It's a plea of a country. And it's written by Sheikh Ali Salman, who was the head of Awafak and remains in prison. Um, but he says... In his book, I also believe that the road to true national reconciliation is still possible. In order to end the current reality and break the historical cycle of political and security crises, this can be achieved by agreeing on a political humanitarian regime characterized by justice and fairness and shaped in a democratic constitutional monarchy that accepts the vast majority of the people of Bahrain in their different factions and sectarian and ideological beliefs. He says, I believe that this road needs patience, efforts, persistence, determination and good faith, and that it is the best path to take for reform, which is better than causing an ongoing pointless struggle of strife and malicious force. I have faith that the use of force, eradication and torture will only bring about more losses to the nation and will not bring about a decent outcome. 
it is really criminal that this man remains in prison and that he's not being welcomed into the political process for next year. So I would say that I echo his, um, oh, I wish that I could echo his hope. It's extraordinary that he still has it. But um, I'm definitely as committed to the rest of you out there um, to trying to um, ease the tension and to uh, make a road forward for an actual reconciliation, which I know Albafak really wants to do also. Thank you, Stacey. Well put. Uh, Ali. Two, two points here regarding the constitutions and one regarding the international Raw or regional raw about what's going on in Bahrain, basically, or especially uh, for our next door neighbor, the big elephant, what we need to talk about now, maybe. Do we have a constitutional problem, problematic in Bahrain? Yes, we do. do are we going to overcome this? I don't think so with this um, type of movements or with this type of, uh, I don't know, we, we pay the price. I mean, we are paying the price and our Bahraini paying the price. But the international community is not doing what they believe on. This is what we want to talk about. Bahraini King, I was involved in uh, a talks with uh, an experts for constitutions, Egyptian experts. And uh, she told me, uh, I was invited to, to, to go for, for the committee to write the Bahraini constitutions, the new one, the 2002 one. <clears throat> and then she was talking to the head of uh, the committee Okay, are we going to write a, a right constitution to Bahrain? And he said, look, I was talking to the king and I asked him clearly, your majesty, what do you want from this constitution? And he told him, and I don't have no problem to say his name now here, who everybody knows, his name is Ramzi al -Sha'ar. The king told him, I want to get the power. And he said, okay, let's show for So he gave him exactly what he wants. And that's the end of the story, because then we moved to 2002, whole power within the king's hands. The Bahraini people, they don't have anything. They, they, cannot move, they cannot move forwards in terms of, you know, reforming the economy also. It's not only politics, because even this economy also in the hand of uh, uh, the family, sports in the hand of the family, charity in the hands of the family. So the constitution is really, really need a big reform in Bahrain, where the whole Bahraini go from <coughs> grassroots to go and participate. And, and 2011, Bahraini raising their demands, that was the basic, you know, the base of also writing the constitution, we believe. That's what we believe as a, as, as a way forward. Go back to the region, regional effects. 1922, when uh, Britain's roles played uh, at that time, <clears throat> I think Major Daly, I don't know, I can't remember all these names, but there was a reform and demand. And the sheikhs agrees on the demands. And then the, the Kabila at the Wasser, they went to the Saudi bin Saud and they said, no, we are against this demand. The influence of Saudis, it's always there in Bahrain. 1971, uh, the uh, former prime minister who died last year, today, 11, uh, 11th of November, uh, after serving like 50 years, nearly 50 years, 49 years, he was written also to uh, to the British uh, officials, uh, uh, governments at that time, asking them not to leave Bahrain. If they leave Bahrain, they will leave Bahrain to three big uh, hands, which is Kuwait and Saudis and Persia. He mentioned that in his uh, documents. So always Bahrain trying to be more closer or much closer to the big elephant here or there. Now, the, the prime minister have his own, his own ideas and his own thoughts, the ex prime minister. And the king, he's, he has his own thoughts and ideas. He told the British government or the Brits, who, my dad told you who asked you to leave. So still the Bahraini government, Bahraini family, they want to be occupied or they, they want to be under control of the international community because they know the power of Bahraini. That's what I want to reach. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I want to- Can I just add something? Oh, sure, Nicole. Yeah. Just you know, um, I don't want to sound offensive, but Bahrain is a small place. It's a small place, and uh, and it should be an easy place. It should be easy. It shouldn't be hard. It's the only place that I can think of 
where despite years and years, decades of oppression, decades of humiliation, of sectarian uh, uh, discrimination, you still have a political class in the opposition, which is uh, non-sectarian, which is united, and which is non-violent. I mean, the the segment read by Tara um, is is not is not the first time that those sentiments are expressed. Where uh, on earth do you have the luck to have those components put together? A leadership united, you know, from the trade unionists to the Wafakis uh, on principles, including on violent principles, that are still followed by the people who have not chosen a different path. They have not chosen a different path because of the leadership of, uh, of the opposition. Now, this is a remarkable opportunity, which the ruling family is not using and the international community is ignoring, simply because they do not understand that legitimacy cannot come from the end of the barrel of a gun. For them, this is simply beyond their comprehension. So I challenge my colleagues, you know, in, in, in the political leadership in Europe, in, in the NGO movement, hey, Bahrain, it's easy. You know, we should be able to do Bahrain. The reason we cannot do it is that those guys are permanently empowered by the money that comes from their neighbors and not just the big way, but also the Emirates, and the utter disregard for uh, violence, uh, which has become the norm. You know, we, we've become so accustomed to violence that even when it's so one-sided, we are able to, to set it aside and to think that this is somebody else's problem. But in, it's easy. It's easy because of the leadership of the opposition. It should be something that we can fix. And it's a shame on us that we can't. Thank you. Um, Sana, it sounds like we have a, a small island. We've got a big elephant, um, a lot of violence. How does Yeah, and I think... Sorry, Stacey, uh, can you repeat, please? Please go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking, like, um, I want to stop at the last comment that Bahrain is easy and um, we have to do something about it. I don't think Bahrain is easy, you know, like um, reading, I mean, studying their constitution, analyzing their constitution and the conflict, and, you know, putting one sect above the other. And, uh, um, what Dr. Said said about uh, the, 70, uh, the, the 1937, um, 73 uh, constitution. And I would agree with him on one thing that that constitution represented more sense of Bahraini identity than the 2002, you know, it had more, um, you know, like uh, things about Bahrain itself instead of having one ruling family. But to say that Bahrain is easy and we have to inf interfere, if I understood what Nic Nic Nicolo said, then I would say this is the danger when we talk about constitution making. It's the interference. And I think, um, one of also the problems when we talk about uh, constitution making is the fact that we think the constitution is the magical one that is going to solve everything. Um, I will quote from or rely on what Ali said, and he said, uh, let's make a constitution that fit the king, right? So it was a legitimate tool. That was the legitimate tool that the king obtains until now, which is a constitutional document. So is the solution really for Bahrain at this stage to write um, you know, a constitution in this form, maybe. And I think I will take it from Tara when she was talking about uh, the code that she, she read, the road is long, um, we can do a reconciliation. Yes, I would agree. If, if that is the path that is going to be used, which is a reconciliation process, you're putting all, um, you know, the conflicting um, parties, the opposition with the ruling family, then you talk about it, uh, then you are trying to find constitutional principles that will guide uh, the next stage, then maybe there is a hope to provide 
a constitutional document that will give justice to everybody. But is this uh, a possibility in Bahrain? I think it's only the Bahraini people can answer this. And from reading you know, the, the scene, I don't think this is a possibility. So, and also elections in the current circumstances will not produce anything different. So what is the solution? I was, um, you know, um, you know, uh, talking about, uh, thinking about um, the things that also surrounding the constitutional um, document that Bahrain has. So even if we produce the most outstanding constitution, what about the constitutional court that you have in Bahrain? The other constitutional institutions that are also um, facilitating um, the king obtaining all the power. Um, so I think when we when we think of Bahrain, it's not easy. There are so many things that has to be discussed and solved before even um, considering, um, you know, a new constitution in Bahrain. Because if we think about all the amendments that took place, they were the amendments that, okay, after a rising or a protest, they were the way of the ruling family to silence the people. We are doing constitutional amendments. And then you have 10, uh, 12 years after, then you do another constitutional amendment. And I'm sure if, if, if a discussion is open now, Bahrain will go for constitutional amendment because this is the way to silence people. Um, and I think, um, you know, um, before talking about this, maybe we need to promote a different culture in Bahrain, culture where people are aware of the things that they want to have in, in the constitutional document, things that they want to see in their future. Because let's say uh, the king appoints a committee or there is a constitutional council, then this council will go, uh, this draft will go for referendum. Um, I don't know, and people in Bahraini people can answer this. Uh, two people in Bahrain uh, know very much about the constitutional rights, the things that they want to have in the constitution. Do you have such constitutional culture? I don't think so. So there is always the fear of providing a new document that this time will be legitimate if it's not uh, done properly in advance. Um, I will stop here, Stacey, and I will jump in whenever is needed because you know, I would like to listen to what everybody has and then add the constitutional element to it. Thank you. Yeah, and I think the constitutional culture piece is really, really important. I mean, how to have one um, as a post-colonial space um, in an authoritarian situation where people um, are manipulated potentially by government media. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a big, big question. You also mentioned um, reconciliation or if we think to transitional Justice, uh, I want to turn to to Ibrahim, um, maybe to answer this, and maybe also Saeed. Um, I, I know that you're feeling like things are really bad, uh, and I think uh, I think that your your take is completely reasonable given what we're seeing. But what what would the conditions be for change? What 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 would happen uh, on the ground? Um, whether a, a move from the government or something that comes from um, a social movement that actually might sort of change the change the dynamic here? What are we looking for to happen so that there can be something positive? Uh, can I answer this question? Yes, yes please. Yes. Okay, all right. Uh, let me just, just, me just start with this constitution. Constitution is only one element for, uh, for change. Uh, we have a constitution that prohibits uh, torture yet torture has been happening all the time. We have constitution that says equal rights, that talks about rule of law, that talks about all of that. Constitution by itself is an important, uh, uh, basically uh, stone in our building, but the building cannot, what, what, what basically uh, uh, glue all this building together is really a culture uh, that this is why the struggle that we have to continue with is not just a constitutional struggle, but this, cultural struggle to change people's mindset as well, so that when their rights are being uh, are taken by the government, then they go and defend it, basically. So it's, it's only one part of this. Now, the other thing is about Bahrain is part of a region. And uh, unfortunately, uh, to say this, we are not, we are the one, we are the smallest uh, in this region, and we are also in a way the weakest link Weakest link in terms, uh, and for, for, from our point of view, that we cannot do much change 
without the bigger brothers and sisters around us uh, condoning that change, accepting that change from that point of view. And the weakest link from the other point of view is that they can easily put $10 billion, $7.5 billion, $17.5 billion have been committed by three GCC states in the last, uh, uh, let's say, less than a decade, basically. And so it is easy to save Bahrain from the brink of bankruptcy because of the mismanagement of the government. So every time the government mismanages the economy, we are supposed to go into basically a, a major a social, socio-economical upheaval. That does not happen because help will come from the sisters around us. It happened in the 1990s. We used to have half of Abu Safa oil field, which is the biggest oil field in the in the turret in the uh, uh, in the uh, water territories around Bahrain, which is in Saudi waters, but have been a long agreement to split it 50-50. When the government was under pressure by the appraiser of the 1990s, it asked for help from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia gave them 100% of the Abu Safa oil field. 2011, the same thing happened. They gave them seven and a half billion for what they call the Marshall. And then again, in 2018, we were on the brink of bankruptcy, got another $10 billion uh, base, life-saving uh, uh, grants uh, and, and loans. So, so, I mean, we have to, at the end of the day, we are part of that region that is that does not want change. And therefore, it is very difficult. We are not just fighting for change for ourselves here. If we can do change here, we will be able to help every other country in the Gulf uh, to do change. So this is really an uphill struggle because of the of the size. Now, you, your question is that how do we get out of this impasse? Of course, international pressure matters, but still, if we don't have a regional change in the mindset, I don't think that's really enough. We had international pressure for a while after 2011, but it was not enough uh, to make change. As soon as that pressure ended, dissipated because the US lost interest of the Arab Spring by 2014, international human rights, because the acuteness of the situation of 2011 was not there anymore. They just went somewhere else to find more acute uh, problems. Uh, uh, when the government since that, they started again this maximum pressure in 2014. So international pressure comes and goes. It's still not, uh, I don't think it's enough. I don't see really much of a change right now. I think I think the government in a way is stupid. They could have split the opposition by allowing, by not really passing the 2018 two laws, which is called the political isolation law and followed by civil society isolation law. I don't see what is the reasoning behind this. I mean, the 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 they could have, you know, encouraged certain opposition members to come and 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 participate in the election, therefore splitting the the I'm not I'm not trying to give an idea to the government, but I'm saying that the government does not really think sometimes it does not think strategically. It is moved by an inertia that has been established in 2014 and then continue the pendulum continue to the maximum, although they should have stopped in the middle. So I think it is possible that they will enhance on that. They will think this over, maybe uh, uh, dilute that law to allow for such, such participation by certain members. But I think by and large, most people in the opposition in Bahrain, those who are credible, I think I have not seen any credible person in the opposition, whether in prison or outside prison, who sees that there is a possibility for really uh, 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 participating in the parliament uh, uh, today or in the near future. So I don't see, I think we are continuing on this long process. We have seen this cycle, cycle of reform, followed by cycle of, of repression, and also a cycle of repressed people who go basically calm, and then all of a sudden you have an uprising like we have in 1994, another uprising in 2011. We have seen both, both things happening. And I think we probably, if we just allowed, the, the government did not get the, the life-saving uh, 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 grants from the GCC in 2018, we would have probably went well into this other cycle 
of another uprising. Very astute analysis, and I think these cycles of you know, sort of history repeating itself, for lack of a better term, is is so important to sort of why why the sense of you know maybe international pressure would work, but maybe not. Maybe we're just sort of going to be at an impasse for a very very long time. And I think that that is is fair. Um, Ali has had his hand up for a while. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, digital hands, <laughs> All right. Um, well, I mean, uh, with regards to this point, I still think about how important when Bahrain gets this aid from the neighbor countries like Saudi Arabia or Qatar or uh, Kuwait, and probably Oman is not giving Qatar. We have always historical problem, problem with them. We don't have the governments uh, have uh, family problems with Qatar, and we are losing because of this uh, problem in, um, between Bahraini family, between royal family and the Qatari family. At that time, they were ready to give also 2.5 billion to support uh, Bahrain. And technically speaking, without getting this aid from these countries, we will not have economy in Bahrain. There is no economy. There is no projects. There is no budget for you know contractors to build the country. There is nothing uh, Bahraini governments can do without getting this aid. Uh, the formula of 5150 uh, I can simplify this. 50 is uh, Bahrain oil production. Probably now it's 50,000 per day. I, I guess 43, 45. I was in parliament at that time. And 150 we are getting from Saudi Arabia. That's definitely, it shows you how important Bahrain to Saudi Arabia. And definitely shows you how important not to have uh, uh, Bahrain, not, not Bahrain, not allowing Bahraini to have the power, you know, to, to control to control the country. It's simply in one day, like what they're doing now with the, uh, Lebanon. They want to change their ministers. They want to change their governments. They want to play, play these roles in another country. And in the news, in the newspapers, talking about, uh, you know, not interfering in other international blah, blah, something like that. But in terms of reality, yes, they are controlling the country. We've heard, no matter what we do, what you do as a ruling family in Bahrain, we will not allow a Shia minister in the Ministry of Finance, for example. The Saudi is not allowing this. We've heard from British officials, everything could be okay, but not to have a Shia prime minister in Bahrain. Why? A big question. Why not having a Shia as a prime minister in Bahrain? We don't see any reason other than having Bahraini Shia linking them with Iran. This is what the Saudis always talking about. Our demands is even before Iranian revolution in Bahrain, 1920s, if you go back 100 years ago. So it's always having this as an excuse. And when the Brits, they talk to the Bahraini as an officials, okay, they said, we investigated and we find that there was no link between Bahraini and the Iranian for demands like in demanding in Bahrain. Oh yes, but still they are Shia. So this is also something need to be solved, you know? This is something very, very important. Maybe Tara can help uh, as, a, as an Irish, uh, uh, you know, lady. She, she, she understand more exactly what happened there and in, in that, in that side of, uh, of Europe. But let me say something here before I give the floor to my colleagues. How important we as a Bahraini raise our demands and talk about the demands. In 2011, I had a conversation with MP, uh, uh, Sunni MP, and he said, yes, we do share with you uh, similar, like, you know, what you, you, your concern, the demands, what you, are, what you are looking for, we do share with you, but our people is not ready to pay the price. I see the Bahraini, all of them, they are in one boat. All of them, they are paying the price now. The price of, uh, my friend Nicolo said, we don't have a state, we don't have corruption. All what we have, we have one family controlling the country as a company. And Bahrain in terms of finance, maybe Mr. Sharif, he can give me maybe 10 examples. We have bigger companies than Bahrain as a state, you know, in terms of funds, in terms of finance, in terms of budget. Apple maybe is bigger than Bahraini budget. I mean, you know, maybe smaller than Apple. Uh, Walmart is bigger than Bahrain. And they have a director and they have one COO and they manage, you know, to, to, to control all, the, all this company. The things here, 
this ruling family, they don't want to give it from their power to the Bahraini. This is, it's very understandable from our side, but it's not understandable like when you said, we have a state and you don't want to give this power to the Bahraini people. And you stated this in the constitution, you said, well, the, the Bahraini can decide about their future or about the, the way they want to be ruled. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Dr. Shahabi. I wanted to let you have a have yeah. a role here. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I believe the the situation has become so complicated now, uh, and it has intermingled with the, the between the local, the domestic, and the regional. That I cannot see a way out. Number one. Uh, it, the UAE has become a stakeholder, a very powerful stakeholder in Bahrain. It has pulled Bahrain to normalize relations with Israel. And uh, this has caused a lot of trouble inside uh, the country. This is number one. So UAE probably is more probably or prominent than Saudi Arabia and maybe more influential in Bahrain. I don't know, uh, but it seems to me that way. Number two, the introduction of uh, Israel or the pulling of Israel into the into the regional uh, disputes is problematic. Also, that is a new element that has entered into the uh, political uh, equation. Now, as for the Shia Sunni element, I believe that the I do not. I never one day felt that it is uh, that the that the regime is racist or, or sectarian against the Shia. I, do not, I believe it is, it is uh, sectarian against every Bahraini, the Shia or a Sunni. Ibrahim Sharif was jailed like uh, Jawad Fayouz, like uh, anyone else, like uh, Sheikh Ali Salman, like Hassan Mushama, like anyone else. So it is in the, in the, the Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Ali Salman in the 90s and two other uh, clerics were uh, banished, were put on, the airplane to uh, and they came to London, in the same way as uh, Abdul Rahman Al Bakr and Abdul Aziz Shamlan were put on a boat in uh, January 1957 and sent to uh, with Abdul Ali a third Shia, two Sunni, two Sunnis and the Shia uh, leaders of the mid 50s uh, uprising, and they were banished and sent to exile to Saint Helena in the uh, uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. So the treatment of any opposition is the same. Whether it is a Shia, we will cut your head. We will, uh, we will say that you are, uh, you are supported by Iran and you are an Iranian agent. Before they said that Ibrahim Sharif and others would be uh, Egyptians, uh, would, be, would, would have been supported by Nasser uh, and others and the Soviet Union uh, and so on and so forth. There are always uh, foreign elements, foreign uh, countries with uh, who are accused of involvement. But the problem is internal. It is domestic. There is an internal problem. As for the possibility of change, it is the regime that doesn't want to change. And it is, I think I want to make a, a distinction between the Bahraini regime and all the other uh, GCC regime. They are different. Uh, Al-Sabah do not uh, feel too, too much, too far from their uh, citizens. Uh, and you see, they feel they have problems, they have a crisis, they arrest and they do torture their opponents sometimes. But then after two or three years, uh, this, the tempers go and then they come back to their senses and they release their uh, opponents. This is what has uh, what happened. And also in Oman, uh, the Qataris do not feel that uh, the people, the Qatari regime or the government doesn't feel that the people are their enemies. In Bahrain, it is not like that. The Al Khalifa do not want to mingle uh, with the people. Dr. Abdul Hadi Khalif once said that we, I want the members of the Khalifa family to feel that they are Bahraini citizens. They do not feel that. The day they, they accept to become normal citizens is the day of openness. That is not going to happen. It, they, there is internal fear. I don't know who created it for inside them, but they could have lived with us easily within the 1973 constitution without their authority being challenged so seriously. But they chose otherwise. This is the situation. What is, go is, is anything going to happen to change? It looks, it seems to me, it is not the 
outside element, it is them. If they want to change, if they want to, I don't think the Saudis will, will ban them, but they always use the Saudis, the outside element, uh, as an excuse not to uh, under, undertake uh, political reforms. Thank you so much. And 100%, I think that there has been um, less care taken and really understanding from the outside, the internal dimensions that you're pointing to. Um, and so I really love that you've raised that. Um, I think, um, you know, that we should really think about sort of the interplay between the internal and the external. Um, and one thing that you said that was really important um, was this notion of an internal enemy, which which my scholarship has also um, sort of analytically sort of been drawn towards that notion that this is a regime that has not just criminalized, but sort of villainized uh, their own population, a majority population, if we're just looking at the numbers, which is very concerning. Um, and so I think that you're raising some really wonderful points. As the facilitator, I, I have to push us a little bit though, to, to maybe try to think of it again, if, there, if it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist, but are, is there anything positive? Is there anything moving in the right direction? And apologies for having to ask this, it's just my role. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I sympathize with, with the struggle and I know people are suffering and, and it's outrageous that that, that is the case. But maybe um, we can turn and maybe to Tara, Nikolai, um, Ali, is there anything, anything that we can say? I, I, I'll just say quickly a couple of things, if I may, please, Stacey. Um, we do try to see things from other people's point of view. And it's very difficult, actually, for any of us to see each other's point of view. We're, all of us are, you know, very single-minded. But they do need to prove um, that they would have a willingness for reform. And you know, there is a strong argument for uh, engaging in dialogue, but they have a fear of the consequence of change. And that's problematic in itself. Um, Niccolo had mentioned earlier that he felt that it should be easy to fix Bahrain. And I think that that was very much misunderstood. It should be easy because of the leaders of the opposition themselves. They're remarkable people, men and women. And they have shown reason. Now, in this situation, the thing that is really lacking is reason. And the international community, we talked as well, the word interference came up. If you look at the island, the United States has its fifth fleet based there so that it can police the Gulf of Hormuz. The United Kingdom now also has its naval base in the region. And with Saudi Arabia right there and Iran, right there. Bahrain is this tiny speck. I mean, it's nearly, you could nearly ignore that it's there, except that it's such a contentious issue. Um, they, if this situation at the moment, we have um, a rising of tension in the Gulf because of oil um, and that, that whole whitewashing and greenwashing situation with COP26 and Bahrain situation in that is another, for another convention. Um, but this is really, for me, it's very alarming because the people who live on the island have no agency whatsoever in any of the decisions that are made on their behalf by the royal family, sweeping decisions that they make, like the Abraham Accords with Trump. And they are emboldened to continue doing that. The people are really disenfranchised. But what I'm saying about an easy fix, a potential easy fix and our interference, the only interference that we have is that we give platforms for people to raise their voices. They, Bahrain can be underestimated because they actually have an incredible education system. These are highly intellectual people. Don't lose sight of that. The majority of young people there have degrees. They all have laptops and um, you know, they're all uh, very social media savvy. Um, and I think that that is, you know, ignored. But what the problem is, they have no agency, they have no access to freedom of expression or the freedom of association and assembly. It's illegal for them to speak out loud. So our interference is by speaking on their behalf because they're at risk to life. 
constantly. We have, when we go to the United Nations, to Geneva, the group that go from all over the world to speak on the behalf of the Bahrainis and the few of them who put their lives on the line to do so are overwhelmed by these massive delegations coming from Bahrain of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of delegates coming on behalf of the regime. So as, as we get smaller and smaller in our outcry, we do tend to speak more boldly because that's what's left to us, our voices, to speak on behalf of the human rights situation. And I would say that we need to really continue to do that and to build the capacity for the Bahraini regime to help them not be so afraid of the consequence of change, which is inevitable, because they are indulging at the moment in political pyrotechnics. It's a very dangerous situation. It is being underestimated. And those superpowers that are meddling and interfering on the island, the consequence is very great for them. We really must reapply ourselves and focus on having the political prisoners and political dissidents released from prison well in advance of next year's UPR session in Geneva and indeed the elections. Because if this situation is not corrected by the people inside the country themselves, the uh, ramifications will be absolutely extraordinary. And I, I really, genuinely, I'm clearly committed to assisting with this situation, as are my various other panelists here. Um, I really think that the exacerbation uh, of sectarianism is something that is fueled by the regime themselves to draw our eye off the situation. They have their um, national debt, as uh, Mr. Ibrahim Sharif had mentioned, has capitulated to 600%. They're bankrupt and have been bankrupt since before the Middle East Spring, and it's continuing. It will only get worse for them. They're digging themselves into their own hole. Thank you for your time. It's, it, it seems like one of the, the positives is just the, the will to keep fighting you know, despite the odds is, is really what you're pointing to. And, and um, I think that's such a profound um, message. They need for, to be building trust with the political parties, not silencing them completely. There has to be for a democratic will to be able to move forward. They need to be embracing those voices and listening to them. It is hard to see someone else's point of view. But in fairness, when we seek reason, that's what we need to do. It's very enlightening to listen to the people that we don't really want to listen to. Absolutely. And I think it's telling that we couldn't get any regime or pro-regime folks to participate even in this forum, um, which says something about maybe the will to listen and to change, which, which so far isn't, isn't there. But, but the, uh, the agency that people on the ground and the political opposition and the dissidents that continue to work, they have our, our utmost respect. And it, it, that, is the, that is the positive, 100%. Uh, Nicolo, did you want to jump in here? Yeah, no, only to say um, thank you um, uh, to, to what Tara mentioned. Yes, obviously, what I meant by easy is that it's not easy at all. There's people in jail, their life is not easy. Uh, there's for people abroad, their life is not easy. What, uh, what should be easy and is not easy is that, you know, it's not, it's not Ethiopia, and it could be. It's not Sudan, and it could be. It's not Syria, and it could be, could have been. And it could still be. Um, the choice uh, made uh, not just by the people, but uh, uh, not by but by the leadership uh, of the opposition has been one of actively resisting uh, a path that maybe the regime would have rather that they chose, which, it, which is that of insurrection. Um, and there's legitimate. Uh, as an anti-colonial uh, insurrection uh, by a racist uh, regime is even in international law. Uh, that is not the path uh, that they chose. And, and they need to be commended for that, uh, but uh, not, not for any uh, you know, other reason that this has obviously been done uh, in the interest of the country. Uh, and uh, that sense of uh, uh, interest of the country as a whole is what uh, has impressed me in my dealings with the opposition, which is clearly not uh, uh, that uh, of, uh, of, the, of the ruling family. 
Now, I'm not saying that uh, the entire regime is constructed of people uh, that uh, only have uh, uh, their own personal interest in mind. Um, I've met uh, and I've interacted with a lot of uh, Bahraini uh, loyal uh, civil servants and, and, uh, and, and people who work for the state. And I say loyal, and I don't mean loyal to the king, I mean loyal to the country. Uh, but the system is a system which is designed uh, to perpetrate and uh, uh, perpetuate um, a, 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 what is an essentially non-state. It's a corporate structure uh, of, of ownership by the family. And when we talk about constitutional reform, um, I mean, it's the, the king admitted it himself. The constitution is designed to provide a quote-unquote legal framework for his rulings. So, uh, you know, when, and, and Bahrain is perhaps the best example of, of, of when we say the difference between the rule of law and the rule by law um, a, as a place where the law is designed to, to, to oppress people and not, uh, not to give them rights. So um, I think, I, think uh, uh, I mean, I, and I, if I was misunderstood by Bahraini, to think that, that, you know, for me, their case is, is it's not easy for them. What I'm saying is that uh, it should be uh, clearer uh, in the minds of those abroad that uh, there is a clear path, um, which is to empower uh, the opposition and to, and to stop legitimizing the regime uh, that, uh, that treats the country as a fifth. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so for our remaining time, I know, uh, Sana, you've had your hand up for a while, and I'm going to turn to you in just one second. I just want to remind our audience um, that we are going to leave time for questions and answers. Um, so if you would like to put a question into the Q&A, um, you may do so uh, as we wrap up the formal part of this session. Um, so um, what we'll do is I think we'll have one go around um, just to give some final thoughts on political reform um, and you know the, the chances for free and fair elections uh, next year, which seem unlikely, but but if you want to have some final comments on sort of how that how that may occur or not occur, we'd love to hear them. Um, but um, again, we'll start with uh, Sana. Thank you, Stacy. And um, again, I want to highlight uh, all my constitutional comments. Again, I'm not Bahraini. Uh, uh, it could be wrong. It's up to the Bahraini people for themselves to decide uh, what their constitution or constitutional uh, reform uh, or the next stage uh, should look like. Um, just, uh, I have a few comments, if you allow me, Stacey. Um, first of all, when I mentioned about um, it's not easy, I did not misunderstand you because I agree with you that it should be, and this is where I was referring to, even when we talk about constitutional reform, it should be an easy one. It should be a clear path. We go to it, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not, unfortunately, due to the complications that we have in Bahrain, due to the extra um, you know, factors that they have. It's not only the internal one. And I think um, you, know, you also mentioned um, the PR um, uh, you know, thing that the royal family has. And I agree totally that uh, be aware Bahrain, for example, was praised by um, the World Health Organization. But when we analyzed it from a constitutional point of view, it violated everything. It violated the right to privacy, um, you know, it, uh, but it was, it was being enabled by the martial law, the, 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 the national safety, all the things that were mentioned in the constitution. So that leads me to another point, which I said before, 100%, I don't think the constitution is the magical one that will, will solve everything. But it is, and I would agree, it's a very, very needed tool. And this tool is, you know, sometimes you have a constitution for a certain period because it's a reflection of the society once. So we are in 2021. Is to 2002 constitution with its amendments what the society wants? Apparently not from even the small panel that we have and from talking with Bahrainis outside and um, when I talked about this change, the constitutional change and the constitutional education, of course, it's not related to the actual education that Bahrainis have. You could have very well educated people, but constitutional awareness or constitutional education is something very, very different. It's about, you know, feeling involved 
and also the, the you know the the uh, the things that you want to have in this uh, in this constitution, the things that represents you. For example, uh, you could write an amazing constitution, but you have certain gaps in it. Uh, and the public will say yes for it, then it's legitimate for many, many years. So you need to promote this constitutional culture. You need to have this, uh, you know, um, the participation, the public participation. This is very different from uh, the normal education. And to talk about uh, the international interference, at the end of the day, of course, I'm going to bring the international interference and I can draw, of course, it's very different. Um, you know, situation, but I am also Palestinian. I understand what international interference mean and what it can, you know, play uh, when you have this kind of like uh, conflicted situation. So, of course, it's very important when you have um, platforms and you provide the Bahrainis with the platforms, and this is uh, very much appreciated. However, I think their only platforms is very, very important. Of course, you have a problem with the freedom of expression, et cetera, et cetera. But once, once we find a way, and I don't think I have the answer, or um, I'm not so sure we have a correct, an accurate answer to how uh, the Bahrainis would have their own platforms in terms of this authoritarian regime. But once Bahrainis, they have their own. Um, Sana, on my end, you're breaking up yeah, a little sure, bit. Sure, sure. Uh, I'm no, sorry, I'm you're breaking uh, up. Yeah. yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, now I can, but I think we're going to have to go to someone else sure. at the moment. But sure. thank you so sure, much. Please. I mean, it's been sure, very, sure. very good, good sure, stuff there. Um, let's go around. Um, Niccolo, unfortunately, has had to leave early, but let's go around, just take a short minute, everybody, on, on a final thought. And then I have a compelling question to ask you after that uh, for anybody who wants to take it. So let's let's do our final go around, Ali. Um, thank you very much. How much time do we have just to go on this? Because I want to go uh, on those eight points with, when you said something positive or constructive. Oh, please, please take a minute now to talk about something positive and constructive. Yeah, that'd be great. We have about 20 minutes, uh, but we do have a question from the audience. Um, so um, take a minute or two. I mean, at least when we, when we go on to, um, you said something positive, uh, the opposition, not rejectionist, the opposition open to, to enter into a dialogue. The opposition um, agreed with nonviolence declarations. The opposition uh, open to discuss these demands. And <laughs> probably uh, we, we may have uh, a different part of the ruling family where they believe more into dialogue. They believe more into reconciliation. And probably this part of family, they, they, they realize the time is different than 1920s. Uh, and the time is different than say even 1990s where they should take everyone on board. They should uh, allow Bahraini to participate in the strategic decisions also when these governments decided to go into a war or into, uh, um, you know, whatever economic reform, they should have a say, they should have uh, a thought into it, not only take it or, or leave it. That's, that's one, one important thing here I would like to, to mention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ibrahim. You want me to say something positive? If you feel it, it warrants well, it. Well, the Do most, not feel forced the into most it. most positive thing we have is we still have a reasonably united opposition on the one hand. And uh, united between those abroad and those inside the country, everybody trying to do his best to enhance uh, basically our position vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the regime. And uh, uh, united between those in jail and those outside jail, I am in contact with my friends uh, in jail, and I know they are still have unbroken will. The morale is very high. And uh, recently, some of them made statements about alternative sentences that should be that are very wise, basically. Uh, this is an, a very moderate opposition, largely. I'm not. To, I'm not necessarily talking about everybody. Some. Some would probably want to, to uh, change the total regime. Most of us will will accept 
a regime reform rather than uh, a regime change. And uh, uh, we are tolerant and uh, most of us as well are gradualists as well. I mean, I understand the need for having a very solid constitution, but also understand the surrounding ar around us. I think the principle should be to have a tight, uh, a waterproof constitution that will give us rights and give the people the right to rule rather than what we have right now. But uh, we have to accept that this is not going to happen overnight. And uh, the, the opposition, I would say most of the people in the opposition would accept a gradualist approach to, uh, to reform. Uh, people have to be released first before any negotiation happens and before any participation in a parliament. Without them outside jail, it will be a betrayal for our cause and will be a traitor for our loved ones who have spent 10 years of their lives defending us and our cause. Yes, thank you. Said. Thank you. Uh, I am not uh, as optimistic uh, and realistic, probably, and rational, like uh, as uh, Ibrahim. Probably I am a bit uh, more of uh, I don't know, I don't want to describe myself as radical, but uh, I would say that after, look, uh, the first time I went to, uh, to uh, the protest was in 1965, when I was 11 years of age. Now, after more than 50 years, I, do, I can't see much, uh, a, big, a big gate to optimism in this regime. This is why I gave up on the idea of reforming uh, this regime. I do not believe it is reformable. I just simply do not believe. The most reformable person was the present prime minister, who is the uh, crown prince. This is to with whom uh, Brahim probably and Ali were referring to when they said there may be some, some logical and rational members of the ruling family, and yet we see what he is doing now. Uh, so I do not... Uh, bit on any member of the uh, of the ruling family so i do not believe that it is reformable i do not believe for a second they will ever stop abusing people we saw the people who were killed in the 60s and in the 70s under torture uh, bunafur and others uh, abraham's colleagues at the time and we saw the people who are killed who were executed on uh, two years ago three years ago so uh, I cannot see any openness with the regime. I do not think they will start a dialogue. I do not think they will ever, they do not believe. They don't like to see me and Ibrahim Sharif uh, on the same platform. They don't want, they may talk to me and they may talk to him, but they don't want us together sitting in a dialogue. They don't want a unified by, uh, front for the Bahraini. Yes, I agree with, with Ibrahim, we are all united. We are, I never felt, uh, not now, from history, 1972, we, we, we embraced uh, Abdul Aziz Shamdan in Duraz, where I come from, to give a, a talk at the time about the elections that was uh, for the writing the constitution. So we are embracing, we are inclusive, uh, but at the same time, with this regime, they are exclusive. The regime is exclusive, the Bahrainians are inclusive. So I... I'm sorry, I will just uh, diverge from my friends and say I'm not optimistic about reforming this regime. Thank you. Tara, final thoughts before our question from the audience. We actually have two now. Sure. Um, I think, uh, well, we need to remember the martyrs and that they have already paid the blood price for the freedom for the country. And we cannot remember them and the sacrifice that they made and that all of their families continue to make because they miss them. They're not ever coming back. Um, and to say that we haven't forgotten any of the political prisoners, not one of them. Uh, some of their names we see regularly and who continue their hunger strikes. And some of their names, we aren't very, they're not very well known, but we have not forgotten any of those men. And we, we want to say that I personally would say that as a word of hope and to encourage you, Dr. Saeed Shahabi as well. It has taken 800 years for Ireland, 800 years, and we never forgot. And we're still on the path. I mean, it's not over for us yet either. We're not all delighted with 
the state of the country in Ireland. We're not delighted with our government at all, but we're on a path and we're staying on it. And I would really encourage you that within this lifetime, I'm confident that there will be change in Bahrain, that the political prisoners will be released, that there will be the possibility of all inclusive dialogue for a better future for Bahrain within this lifetime. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. Inshallah. Inshallah. That's great. Great note to sort of end the formal part on. Um, we do have a question. As advertised, um, I think it's a really compelling one and I'll open it up to any of our panelists who would like to take it on. Uh, one of our audience members would like to know what the role of feminism or a gender sensitive perspective can play uh, in facilitating political reform. Great question. Just see the, the, please go back to the film of Breaking the Silence the documentary by the BBC a year ago, and then that will tell you uh, our views on uh, gender politics and our, and our experiences and suffering uh, across the, the, the gender uh, fault lines. Can I pick up on that? Because I'm a woman, and so I will. Um, I'd like to say that the women in Bahrain are absolutely just they are they really shine for me um that back in 2011 when uh, 48 medics doctors nurses were arrested and tortured uh it was really the women who mobilized um on social media like Zainab al Khawaja Maryam al Khawaja uh, and others and it was a women's movement that came over to Ireland and you know when we talk about international interference um People said to me, you know, why did you get involved in Bahrain? It was because I thought of those women who were in prison at that time and their children at home. And I thought how much the kids must miss their mothers. And so I, you know, as a woman, I put myself in their shoes. And um, I, th I think that, you know, it was really the women's movement in this last generation of rebellion through the Pearl Roundabout was what uh, kind of it brought a different flavor to it this time. Um, if you look as just exactly as Dr. Say Chahabi has mentioned there, women like now Ebtisam al who has suffered an awful lot, I mean, really depraved um, indignation at the hands of her torturers in prison. And yet she continues to be steadfast in her outspokenness and her support for other people suffering inside. So uh, it, it is impossible to... Um, it, it would be, Bahrain would not be what it is. The people of Bahrain it would not be who they are without the women's involvement and the, the movement of women who participated and continue to participate in all of the political and human rights issues that they do. Thank you. Uh, Simon, I mean, I, oh, go just, ahead. Ibrahim, just a quick ahead. word. In 2011, almost half of the participants in the tens of thousands of people who poured into the streets were women. And you can see these even pictures today. If you go back to that era, there's about 50-50. Women participation has been significant. Uh, it may not have been represented equally in terms of people uh, who went behind bar, but in terms of activism, I think women, we are, we are reasonable, we are basically a conservative society when it comes to social norms. But when it comes to women participation in politics, I think we have seen a significant movement forward, especially after 2011. And we have, we have you know, idols, we have, we have people who have contributed significantly to the cause. I mean, uh, we, we're seeing today as if this is today. So no, women had, had a great contribution. And I think uh, a lot of that contribution is probably not seen because uh, not, not a lot of people went to, to prison uh, of these women, but a lot of the support network is actually provided by women. Thank you. Uh, Jawad. Yes, I have <clears throat> a short question to everyone. Uh, yesterday, Bahrain foreign ministers met with uh, Michel Bachelet, uh, the high commissioners uh, in Geneva, and it looks like it's gonna be part of their discussions what being called memorandum of understanding. I'd like to know that's what's the response or the messages of all our panelists uh, to the high commissioner towards this uh, 
idea or uh, the vision toward the memorandum of understanding between Bahraini government and the High Commissioner Office. Thank you. Who would like to take that one? Just jump in. Asana. Uh, no, can I, can I just go back? Uh, I'm sorry, I just wanted to comment on the previous one very quickly because I think it was um, a very important one, right? And again, uh, because that, that, that question brings us back to the rule of the constitution. And I have to say that in, in political change or political reform uh, situations, the rule of women is very, very important. I really hope in Bahrain, if um, there will be any kind of um, political uh, change or reform or whatever, or constitution making, that all the great women that, uh, that were just mentioned now and uh, their activism uh, was mentioned, not to be put aside in the constitution making because looking at the Bahraini constitution, and I have to say again, it was, uh, of course it's expected, but it's not really at all gender uh, sensitive. And this, this actually helped in having uh, all the issues that women in Bahrain um, have. Uh, and I remember when we were abroad, there were amazing Bahraini women um, giving talks about Bahrain and, you know, trying to uh, do this international advocacy. But unfortunately, the role will always be limited or their um, political participation will be always be limited due to the constitution that Bahrain um, has. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Jawad, that I skipped your question, but I really needed to highlight this um, because this is very crucial part because women usually are the ones behind the scenes. So I really hope in the new constitution making the process or building that Bahrain will take at some point in the future, and this is the hopeful thought, that they won't be neglected or they will be in the back seat again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ali, did you want to talk about the high commissioner question that Joao Yes, posed? just a very, very quick uh, on, on this one. Uh, we don't know what will be in that memorandum of understanding as a political parties, for example, what we, we need to know um, to have this as a part of transparency, maybe the high commissioner office can uh, discuss this publicly. Bahrain has been suffered long time, long time ago from the human rights uh, abuses and uh, within, I mean, Bahrain governments or systems. So what we'd like to see, we'd like to see this uh, uh, terms and conditions and the memorandum of understanding. That's number one. Number two, we would like to see a high commissioner office inviting these uh, human rights bodies in Bahrain to go to the office, to her office, and to be received well, like sh she was receiving yesterday Bahraini foreign minister, discussing this these things. So then we will have kind of balance between what's uh, of, uh, Bahraini uh, government's views and what's the NGOs or human rights uh, defenders views. Thank you very much. Um, and before we get to Ibrahim, I have a, another question I'm going to roll in. You're happy, Ibrahim, you can comment on the high commissioner question as well. We have another question about uh, Bahraini activism, um, the benefits and challenges of being in country and being activist versus being in the diaspora and on the outside. Um, being an activist, um, and one of our audience members in particular would like to hear from you, Ibrahim, about what it what it's like to um, keep you know to keep your your hopes up and your your courage up while you're you're still there um, fighting the good fight. So, I'll give you the floor. Okay, for the first question uh, about the commission, uh, Human Rights Commission, I am a bit worried about uh, this memorandum of understanding, whatever they're thinking about. Let's, this is something we discussed actually while we were in the prison in 2000, uh, 2000 I think 2012, there was some, some uh, talk about that and we had a discussion and with us was uh, my friend Abdul Hadi Al Khwaja as well. And we had a point of view about when should the commission open office and when it should not. Let me just say, if it's a, it's a technical program, which is a one way street for the government, to take advice from the commission without allowing the commission to do its job of going into prisons and investigating human rights situation and receiving uh, 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 basically uh, uh, complaints from, from relatives and prisoners, then this will be a whitewash. I'm sorry to say that. 
So I think it has to be a condition. A one-way street is not going to work. The commission has a responsibility to protect human rights activism in this country. And it's, if it's going to do what uh, uh, you know the government did after the, uh, the independent commission, the independent commission made certain uh, conditions or certain uh, recommendations, including a training the, the police force, everything. What we have seen after that was a worse situation. Now we have, what we have seen is that torturers who know, who talk the talk and walk the walk. Before that, we had torturers who know nothing about human rights. Now we have torturers who know everything about human rights. They can talk to you, they can sweet talk to anybody about this. So let me warn about this. The Human Rights Commission has a responsibility. If it's not going to improve the human rights situation in Bahrain, if it's going to only improve how the Bahraini government looks, I think this is really a disaster. It will be a whitewash. On the other question, the inside and outside, let me just say this. Sometimes people say those people outside are putting their foot in cold water. No, they are not. They are doing, they have no choice to be outside. And probably I have very little choice to go outside. As long as I can work and struggle from inside the country, I will continue staying here. Those of us who have no choice or who are really in danger, those who have been stripped of their nationalities have no choice. Those who are being uh, 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 sentenced in Bahrain have no choice. Those who could be, when they come, they could be tortured or, or sentenced. They really have no choice. All of us complement each other. Every single thing that you do there is helpful for us. There is no small thing here. It's all, every small things build into a bigger thing. So thank you all for, for, for your activism. Uh, we will continue to work here and uh, we, I think we complement each other. Thank can, you. I, can I add something to this about- uh... Yes, very quickly. And then we have to wind down because we've okay. run out of time completely. So you'll be the last word. Okay, it is about this uh, High Commission office going to Bahrain. Uh, many of us have talked to them, uh, and probably tomorrow we'll be speaking to, to them as well. But uh, basically, we would like to see, number one, the uh, experts to be allowed into Bahrain, number one. Uh, number two, uh, the, it, my view is that it, it may not go ahead because it seems to me that uh, the the uh, official the, the office is aware that it, they are going to be used for uh, media purposes, and that uh, hopefully they will put they will drag their foot um, and say that we will go on our own uh, conditions, not on your conditions. And finally, uh, I think human rights will uh, benefit most if the uh, the, the the local. Uh, also, the local uh, human rights activists uh, like Nabi Raja, Abdul Hadi Khawaja, Abdul Jay Singes are allowed to perform their duties as a human rights activist. Thank you. All right. Well, we've come to the end of our time. I know this conversation could continue. I would love to hear more, and I'm sorry that we have to stop for now. But the good news is we have another session coming up. So we're going to take about an eight minute or so break. And at the top of the hour, uh, we will have another session where we will be hearing um, some papers that are going to be presented by scholars uh, and human rights activists uh, on specific topics um, within um, the political reform in Bahrain topic. Okay, so stay tuned, um, stay with us, uh, and we will be back at 12 noon and leading that facilitation um, will be either Dr. Mavon or, or Drury Dyke. Um, depending. Uh, so Jawad, any, any parting thoughts before our break? Yes, uh, sharply within five minutes, we'll be back. Uh, and our colleague Drew Dayek will chair the second session, which is going to be presentation or uh, 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 some papers. Uh, and that will be continuation of our discussions, focusing on the issues related to the directly political reforms and human rights reforms. Thank you to all our panelists. Absolutely fabulous con conversation and the depth and the courage. And thank you so, so much. We'll see you, everybody back here in five minutes. Yeah, thank please so log much. in and don't switch off. And uh, just you can switch off your video, but please join us. And uh, within five minutes, we'll be back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, we're just trying to work out what to, uh, how to, how to sort Kazuto and uh, and Luciano. Luciano and Kazuto, if you're there, can you tell me if you're Resume. able to present? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I am here. Yes. Uh, share screen. Are you I, able to? I can. Yeah, I am able, yes. Okay, great. Okay. Um, I'm going to assume that others are back or coming back. And we will get this second session underway. Okay. I will assume... Uh, Okay, it looks like Abbas, our technical chap, has, has uh, sorted Kazuto. That's good. I'm going to get underway, if that's okay. I, I, I think the live stream continued in any case. Thanks for rejoining uh, the second session of today's discussion on political reform in, in Bahrain. In the second section uh, today, we're going to have five speakers. This will be a speaker-oriented um, event, not like the first session. The first session was a conversation. We're going to start with uh, Luciano Zakara with Kazuto. Um, I'm not going to be able to pronounce your last name correctly, but so please Matsuka. help me Matsuka. as you come along. <laughs> Matsuka, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know about you, uh, Kazuto, but Luciano is a researcher and assistant professor in Gulf politics at Qatar University, if I'm not mistaken. And also, are you not a visiting um, assistant professor at uh, Georgetown in, in Doha? Yeah, okay. Second of all, uh, following Luciano and, and uh, Kazuto, we'll have Zainab Adrazi. Zainab is a lawyer and women's rights activist. Um, I think you're also a member of the Women's uh, Renaissance Association. Yeah. Third. Thank you. Good. You'll be you'll be second. Okay. Third, thank you. We'll have, uh, third, we'll have my colleague Said Yusuf Al Muhafda, who is the vice president of Salam for Democracy and Human Rights, a long-standing human rights uh, defender and activist from Bahrain, now in now now in Germany, sadly. Fourth, Hassan uh, Sarhan, who's a lawyer, uh, an attorney at G and B, attorneys and legal consultants. Um, I, 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 I'm told he has experience in, uh, uh, in risk and compliance. Last but not least, and uh, on my screen at the moment, I'm using this on my phone, is Fatima Yazbek. Fatima is, uh, we've shared some panels before, I think Fatima, is a human rights defender, member of the Gulf Institute for Democracy and Human Rights. Uh, that's the five. That'll be the order in which we're doing things today. I'm going to give you approximately 10 minutes. If you go over, I'm going to be brutal. Um, I want you to go under because I'd like to have around half an hour for, for us to discuss. Uh, Luciano, I see you making hand signals. Uh, I don't know if you're in the you're not even in the same room. Are you, are you ready to go? Great. Okay. So I don't know what you need to do if you just can unmute yourself. Yes, um, I will. Great, fantastic. Will the, the, the PowerPoint. Thank you so much. Over to you, and your your time starts now. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, of course, Sal um, Salam and, and Sipat for organizing this and for accepting our 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 proposal. The the paper we are presenting or, or the presentation we are presenting with uh, Casuto is called a Constitution for Who and What. The role of constitution and the status of political societies in contemporary Bahrain. I have to admit that it's very difficult to, and it's challenging to present after a wonderful debate we had before. Uh, and I would say not very um, optimistic uh, uh, panel, but we also have to say that we share uh, the same lack of optimism on, on political reform in, in Bahrain. So we divided our presentation in five main points, uh, main argument, the legal framework, uh, mainly the 2017 constitution, the other laws that they are affecting the, the political parties, uh, some uh, data from research-based evidence, and some conclusion and uh, future prospect to discuss with you. 
the main argument we are presenting here is that uh, the current legal framework, including the 2002 constitution and its uh, 2017 revision does not necessarily uh, mean that uh, the regime has the willingness to introduce more democratic, just and equal elements for, for this citizen uh, participation, something that was mentioned in the previous uh, round table as well. Rather, it is often used uh, by the regime as a tool to retain power by curtailing opposition uh, forces. So this is the main argument that uh, now Casuto will uh, develop, uh, uh, and then I will come back for the, the conclusion section. Um, in this section, um, I will uh, focus on the 2017 constitution. In the 2017 constitution, in its preamble, it stipulates that it is our desire to complete the requirements of the democratic system of government. And in addition to that, in articles four and 18, uh, they guarantee equality and justice for its citizens. And in this context, a question arises. The question is that, can this be interpreted as the kingdoms move toward a more democratic, just, equal style of governance? Our answer is, well, not really. In this light, I'd like to shed light on the other dimension of the constitution, which in our view has two major characteristics. The first is the regime's domination of executive political power. And the second is the opposition's limited ability to ameliorate the political status quo through the legal framework. Now let's uh, briefly look at the, the first point, which is the regime's domination of executive political power in the 2017 version of the constitution. Um, here we have uh, two main examples. The first one is the articles 33, the clause D, F and H, and also article 52 and 54 clause D which render the king ability to appoint prime minister, ministers, 40 members of the consultative council, which is uh, this upper chamber, and also the judges. The second example is the article 120, class C, which stipulates that it is not permissible under any circumstances to propose the amendment of the constitutional monarchy and the principle of inherited rule in Bahrain, of course, in other words, the rule by the Al Khalifa family. In regard with the second point, which is opposition's limited ability to ameliorate the political status quo, um, we have three examples. The first is the Article 67, Clause A and D, um, which guarantees the Prime Minister immunity from the vote of no confidence from the Chamber of Deputies, which is a uh, um, lower uh, elected chamber. And the second is the Article 66, Clause C, a vote of no confidence in a minister is difficult to realize uh, because of this particular article by the, by the opposition forces in the parliament. And the, the third example is the Articles 80 and 103, which stipulate that both councils and the National Assembly can be deemed valid with at least a quarter of the membership is in attendance, um, which makes the opposition boycotting um, ineffective uh, measure to uh, challenge the political uh, status quo. Now I'd like to briefly uh, compare the 2017 version of the constitution with the original 2002 constitution. Our question here is that, is the kingdom going toward a more democratic system? And we can find that at least 18 articles were amended to a varying degree in the 2017 constitution. And some of the examples, um, we put it on the screen. Um, as you can see, the first example is the changes in articles 42, class C, 46, 85, and 102, um, in which the minor changes favoring the elected council of deputies were made, but only superficially. 
meaning that no actual uh, increase in political power in the opposition were realized. The second example is a change in Article 103, um, which, as I mentioned before, uh, stipulates that National Assembly can be deemed valid even amid opposition's boycott. Um, so given, given this observation, we could here say, claim that um, the kingdom is not heading toward a more democratic system. But of course, the constitution is not the only uh, legislation that the kingdom has. And so we have to also examine the other relevant laws as a real life evidence of curtailing opposition forces uh, by the legal framework. We found that 99, sorry, uh, 990 citizenships were revoked under the following two laws between 2012 and 2019 including Ayatollah Sheikh Isa, Isa Qasim, the spiritual leader of the now dissolved uh, opposition, main opposition party, al -Bifak. The first law that I'd like to shed light on is, uh, is the law number 58 of 2006 with respect to protecting the society from terrorist acts. Its 2013 amendment stipulates that the courts can decide on citizenship depri deprivation based on terrorism related charges. And this law has been used as a main legal base to um, strip citizenship uh, off from its citizens between 2013 and 2019. The second law is the Bahraini Citizenship Act of 1963, which has been amended five times in the past, the latest two being 2014 and 2019. And after the 2019 uh, amendment, the cabinet can now arbitrarily and directly revoke citizenship without court procedures, um, further curtailing the opposition forces in the kingdom. The third law that we'd like to shed light on is the law on the exercise of political life. It's also known as the law uh, number 14 of the 2002 laws. Its 2018 amendment prohibits first those who sentenced more than six years in prison, and the second, leaders and members of dissolved political organizations, of course, they include um, al Wifaq and also Wad, from running for elections. The last law that we'd like to shed light on is uh, 2005 Political Society Law. Um, whose 2016 amendment specifically prohibits religious figures from political participation and also authorizes a court to dissolve organizations upon request by the Ministry of Justice. And that was the case when the uh, when al Wifaq and Wa'ad were both uh, dissolved in 2016 and 2017, respectively. Now I'd like to uh, pass the floor to my colleague, Dr. Chan. So apart from uh, the legal uh, framework and the, and the changes in the, in the legislation that further uh, increase the, uh, I would say the repression or the um, limitations uh, granted to the opposition to uh, participate in politics, uh, we have also, we wanted to also to share with you the uh, research-based evidence provided by different organizations and indicators that they are commonly um, uh, admitted or accepted by uh, academics and scholars regarding the quality of uh, democracy, the quality of freedom, the quality of liberties, political rights and civil liberties in the world to demonstrate that apart from these laws and the changes that, they, that we were discussing, these indicators are showing how the situation has been deteriorating lately, uh, mainly after the Arab Spring until uh, nowadays. For instance, the Freedom House uh, uh, main indicators uh, based, uh, uh, I mean, dedicated to political rights and civil liberties and internet uh, freedom, they are showing very uh, negative scores with the uh, political rights to uh, over 40 possible in the three areas, electoral process, political pluralism and participation and functioning of the government. Uh, the um, score on civil liberties that includes freedom of expression and beliefs, association and organizational rights, rule of law, 
and personal autonomy and individual rights, only 10 points over 40 possibles, and internet freedom, 30 over 100. So the general, the overall assessment of Freedom House is that uh, Bahrain is a not free country. Similar uh, evidence can be provided by other indicators, which is uh, varieties of democracy. Uh, in some of the indicators that we selected to, to show the situation of the political parties, is the, uh, the electoral democracy index that uh, had to do with clean elections, freedom of association, and freedom of, uh, and expression of expression, that gives uh, 0 0.12 point out of one. And then two more, in, more important ones that had to do with exclusion uh, index, uh, exclusion by political groups and ex exclusion by social groups, that uh, in this case, higher is, the, is, is worse, uh, 0 0.81 and 0 0.92 for uh, both of them. Then other three uh, indicators that they are um, produced by the Electoral Integrity Project, Transparency International and Reporters Without Borders, that they are showing a negative picture of the, the current uh, political situation in Bahrain. Uh, the perception of Electoral Integrity Index is giving Bahrain 40 out of... Jen, try and pick up the pace, yeah? Try and pick up the pace. We're, we're into 12 minutes now, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I know, Just I know. a bit quicker. Sorry. Yes. Uh, so the perception of electoral integrity index is 40 out of 100. Transparency corruption uh, perception index is scoring uh, also bad uh, Qatar. But the, what we wanted to show here is that from 2012 until now, uh, Bahrain dropped nine places, which is something that is interesting. Uh, bearing in mind that this was after 2000, 2011 uh, demonstrations. And then the ranking of uh, reporters without borders uh, situates uh, Bahrain very low, 168 out of 180 uh, countries. So the conclusions, uh, we all more or less share the, the negative prospects that our colleagues made in the, in the first round. Uh, the legislation, as we demonstrated, has been going to the opposite direction from what the constitution states in terms of opening the, or broadening the participation. And the amendments we have been discussing have been made, uh, especially after the so-called Arab Spring, to further curtail opposition forces rather than including them in the political process. Um, uh, the current status of the opposition political forces, uh, the political uh, societies, I mean, uh, basically they are banned and dissolved. Their cadres are prevented to be politically active, uh, as we demonstrated with the with the. Other, other laws that they are in place, and no changes in the constitution, electoral law, association law, uh, are promoting opposition societies' inclusion into the political process, but the opposite, meaning that the current legal framework is highly unlikely to change in favor of opposition in the coming years, mainly bearing in mind that next year we will have legislative elections, uh, and meaning that the impact of these 2022 elections will be meaningless in the absence of the opposition, unless a huge change is going to happen uh, in the short time, which we think uh, is not going to happen as we, we, we have been witness, witness, listening in the previous uh, one. So this is all we wanted to share with you. And of course, we would love to, to discuss this uh, further uh, in the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much, gents. That was... Uh... Uh, it was a, a, a romp through why uh, or, or how a state can, in a sense, legalize a one-party state and harks back to one of the comments, I think it was Nicola or somebody else said about uh, rule, uh, rule by law as opposed to rule of law. So I'm sure we'll come back to it. Bit on the long side, but nonetheless. Uh, Zainab, uh, Zainab yes. Adarazi. Um, yeah. are, you, are you ready to take it away for around yes, 10 minutes? Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> If it can be less than 10 minutes, that would be even better. No, I don't think so. I have 10 papers. Um, I will try my yes, best to finish it in okay. 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for hosting me. And uh, hello to everybody. Uh, my subject will be depri uh, depriving women affiliated with dissolved 
political association their civil right of standing for election to the board of director of civil society association in Bahrain based on the article amendment number 43 from decree law number 21 for the year 1989 which was issued as a law regulating social and cultural association and clubs, uh, private bodies working in the field of youth and sport and the private institution. Female volunteers affiliated with the Bahraini Women's Union, including other women's association, be it related to the civil society or their uh, profession who were previously member of opposition uh, political uh, society that were dissolved by arbitrary uh, court ruling, have been subjected to the uh, annulment of the result of their victory in the election of their general assemblies through letters of rejection and administrative circulars by the Ministry of Labor and Social Development, which is the body responsible for civil society association by requesting these uh, institutes as <coughs> administration to exclude the winning member in the election in the various forms, such as rotating uh, position or re-election, which part particularly uh, led to the depriva <laughs> deprivation of many female volunteers of their legitimate rights to run for election of the board of directors of these women's association, including the Bahraini Women's Union. A professional association and other in various uh, field uh, and in various fields. And in anticipation of the ministry subsequent refusal and its pressure on the concerned association of institution of council, the election result uh, or be subjected to other uh, escalatory uh, measures that are not uh, explicitly disclosed. The following is the state, a statement of what the Bahraini Women's Union has been exposed to in this context. On September 14, 2019, a new board of directors of the Bahraini Women's Union was elected from among its elected member as uh, Zaina Maldorazi, vice president of the council, and uh, Safiya Al Hassan, secretary of the Council in valid election uh, approved by Ministry of Labor and Social Development. On the January 19, 2020, the Board of Directors of the Women's Union was surprised by a letter from the Ministry of Labor and Social Development delivered personally to the chairperson of the Board of Directors Mrs. Uh, Badria Al Marzoug requesting the, uh, the dismissal of both Zainab and Safiya Al Hassan from the board of director of the Women's Union. The board of director of the union was surprised by this letter as the name of the female member nominated for the election of the board of director of the Bahrain Women's Union were sent to the ministry two months before the election uh, date and the ministry did not submit any comment. The Bahraini Women's Union also sent the ministry. Uh, I'm sorry, there is a sound here. I don't know from where. Anyway. The Bahraini Women's Union also sent the ministry result of the election held on September 14, 2019, and no comments were received at the time. This, sorry for this, uh, I just want to know. I don't know. No comments were received at the time. This this exclusion request constituted constitute the first precedent where the result of legitimate election were challenged in the history of the women union. 
This letter was followed by a phone call from the director of the Department of Support for Civil Society Organization and the Ministry of Labor and Social Development to improve the matter as stated in the letter and stating the official viewpoint of the ministry regarding the denial and the ineligibility of the two uh, women, Al Dorazi and Al Hassan, from running for the subsequent election of the board of director of the women's union and any other civil organization because they were privately member of a dis dissolved political uh, association according to the amendment article 43 of the law on society social and the, uh, and the cultural club and the private bodies working in the field of youth and sport and the private institution and, the, and the, that the ministry is not concerned with making or changing law, its only concern is implementing them and that the law is clear. It is a requirement that a member of the board of directors enjoy all this civil and political rights. The Ministry of Labor and Social Development also uh, circulated a letter sent by the director of the Department of Support of Civil Organization to various civil society, association, club, federation, etc. on January 15, 2020, uh, stating that the ministry will subject the names of candidates for membership in the civil society's board of directors to security scrutiny within the framework of cooperation and prior condition, uh, coordination with the Ministry of Interior Affairs, uh, prior to the holding of the ordinary uh, General Assembly. Nahdat Al Bahrain Girls Society and uh, Awal Women's Society which are founding association of the Women's Union and are active members of it to this day had faced similar situation in terms of the ministry's rejection of the uh, result of their general election for the same reason, with the different uh, procedure being imposed by the ministry on each, on each association, other civil society organization have faced the same situation. The women union has uh, collectively rejected the ministry's uh, decision to exclude the two members because no action or statement was issued by them that contra uh, contradicts the goals of the union and its state. A uh, strong statement of solidarity were issued by women association and other. However, the ministry stressed that the decision were into effect the moment the that the, uh, that the message has been received and that the opinion of the union is of no importance in regards to the higher power of the law and that the two excluded members can resort to the judiciary if there is any opposition. Since past experience with the judiciary have proven ineffective, the two members uh, preferred not to resort uh, to the court for the fear, the fear of a uh, of court ruling confirming the ministry behavior and thus becoming a judicial uh, pre uh, precedent that is difficult to change. Uh, uh, there is more time or? Mm, uh, I hope. Yes, you have okay, about 55 seconds. But <laughs> given, given a large percentage given, of the members of civil yeah, society organization it. were members of dissolved political organization. In 2001, a great shift in the political atmosphere happened in Bahrain, and the new avenues of political life uh, appeared, and political participation was encouraged. Many of the members of civil society formed the core group of the new established political societies uh, or were active member in them after their uh, reg uh, regulating laws were uh, passed. 
and there was no differentiation or prohibition of members of political association of from running and being elected to the Council of Association affiliated under decree law number 21 of 1989. When the law on social and cultural association and the club private bodies working in the field uh, of youth and the sport and the private institution was issued. However, in mm, 2018, the condition that must be the condition that must be met by a member of the board of direct directors were amended, adding that they should enjoy all their political rights. This amendment was issued by law number 36 of 2018, uh, amending article 43 of the law of association when it become a requirement for a member of the board of director to enjoy all his civil and political rights. After the amendment of Ministry of Labor and Social Development began to apply pressure on civil society association by rejecting the result of their election and asking for the exclusion of members uh, who were former uh, member of this dissolved political association, in a clear attempt to empty the civil society association of their active and creative cadres for life. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, no worries. That's that's great. I mean, a, a, a kind of a microcosm of the of the larger issues that that we were speaking about before. That's almost like a case in point, an example of a of a particular case. Um, but Zainab, I just want to mention as well, mention for everyone uh, that the full papers, and, and hopefully Luciano um, and Kazuto, you will be part of this, that the full papers of all of the papers and all the, the discussions that we'll be having, we will put them on the uh, Salam for Democracy and Human Rights uh, uh, website, kind of either one by one or collectively as, as a report. Look, I want to move on. Um, uh, Said Yusuf Al Mohafta, are you ready to take it away? You're nodding. Okay, I can assume. Are you? Have you unmuted yourself? I'm okay now. Or? Yeah, you're good. You're good. Okay, good. Uh, go for it. Take it away, please. Thanks, Said Yusuf. I, I introduced Said Yusuf before. He's my colleague um, in Salon for Democracy. He's the the vice president, of course. I think for, for human rights activists uh, who worked on Bahrain, I don't think he needs any particular introduction, but, uh, but over to you, Saeed Youssef. Uh, thank you very much. And I will try to be uh, as short as possible. And uh, yeah, I just would like to, uh, uh, my paper will be about Salam uh, vision uh, to human rights um, uh, reform in Bahrain. Um, uh, and I will try to, take the main point in, in my paper and the rest, as you mentioned, it will be published online. So the government of Bahrain uh, announced that currently they are working on a national uh, plan for human rights, uh, 22 to, till 26. And, uh, but it has excluded all independent civil society uh, organization from participating uh, in the formulation of the plan. Uh, limiting participation only to government agency. That's the one point. Uh, we think that it's necessary to set a vision for human rights, of course, and adopt uh, a concept of comprehensive human rights reform within the framework uh, of working project and within the methodology uh, to radical and sustainable political uh, reform in Bahrain. This working project must include a vision, uh, objective, mechanism, and the means within the framework of working program and time plan for implementation and follow up. Uh, and that's something miss missing in the national uh, human rights plan. And, uh, uh, and also uh, we think that a follow up and also the need to harmonize the project with international uh, determines and standard in the previous projects that have achieved success in human rights uh, reform. Um, 
Moreover, uh, it's needed uh, on how the project will achieve basic international human rights principles, such as transitional justice, which is very important, justice for victims and uh, reparation. So the government of Bahrain must take concrete uh, uh, measures to build the trust uh, in, the, in the seriousness of their project. So that's very important. It should include releasing all prisoners of conscience, including opposition figures, and leaders and ending harassment and prosecution of civilians uh, for peacefully ex uh, uh, exercising their uh, ex freedom of expression and opinion within uh, the limits of, you know, uh, and also which all of these guaranteed by international uh, covenant on civil and political rights. Uh, of course, release, uh, releasing, we think that releasing prisoner of conscience would contribute to building a trust, uh, bridging rifts, and contribution to national reconciliation and national dialogue. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about the what we call it uh, misuse of power uh, within some of the ministers in Bahrain. Uh, we think that basic and fundamental rights should be granted in the legislation. I will give just very fast three examples about individual ministers, uh, for example. They have how much authority, like uh, when it comes, for example, to the um, Minister of Labor and Social Affairs, they have the authority to uh, grant a license for a new uh, institution and restrict their work, uh, the work of registered institution, I mean, uh, a, a, a huge restriction uh, on them. Uh, and a, a recent example is the a, a Minister of Justice who yesterday uh, uh, denied a, a conference uh, or an economic conference uh, in al Mumbar al Taqaddumi uh, in Bahrain. So again, so Minister of in, uh, 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 two ministers are abusing their power to restrict, uh, you know, freedom of expression. The third one, the third example is also the Minister of Interior, who also has the authority to uh, to deprive a citizen uh, uh, of, of his national of their nationality by administrative decision. Uh, if he personally doubt uh, the citizen loyalty, uh, this is a human rights violation and that strips the citizen of all constitutional natural and human rights and so that should be uh, uh, stopped i don't know how many minutes i have okay and uh, also we think it's necessary to cooperate coordinate uh, with international external human rights organization within uh, also uh, human rights body uh, like un human rights body uh, and preparing programs and plans for human rights reform that's very important we also recommend restructuring uh, the National Institution for Human Rights in IHR within the framework of the Paris Principle, as well as restructuring the official judicial and human rights uh, regulatory institution to align with international framework, framework uh, charters and treaties to ensure independence is achieving justice. Uh, um, uh, and redressing victims. And that's not happening with ombudsman and other government institution. And, and that's, so the main idea of their uh, work and established did not uh, uh, happen and, or did not achieve uh, anything, justice for the victim. Also, we think uh, that allowing United Nations special rapporteur to enter the country uh, and cooperate with the authority is very important involving civil society in a civil society an institution uh, and a specialized individual in developing national pl plans for human rights uh, also supervising and following up on the implementation of un and international recommendation like BI or also local like bici monitoring also the bahrain commitment to its human rights obligation and that should be with those independent uh, NGOs and, and uh, civil society. Also al allowing full access to information and data for all citizens and human rights body. Uh, um, and that's the right of information is classified today as a, as a human rights. And that's not happening. I just give also another quick example of, I, I read just af this afternoon, Zainab Abdel Amir, a uh, member of parliament, she said that this, um, uh, that was released a recent uh, national or like called financial audit report uh, 
uh, was uh, announced or uh, or published, but only they published uh, 15 or 16 pages or 18 pages, I'm not sure, but 480 pages of that report was uh, was denied to the public, to the press. So the press and public were not allowed to see uh, the full report. They were allowed only to see uh, 14 or 15, I'm not sure the, the number, but something like this. Uh, that's also, again, another challenge. Um, so uh, also we have, uh, I hope I have a minute, okay. Uh, also we have this idea of uh, Reconciliation uh, as uh, equality and recon reconciliation council. So we propose the formation of an equality and reconciliation council with the uh, with the authorization and approval of the king and the government, staffed by competent members of civil society and member of the state, who are independent of the security agencies, which is very important, uh, under the supervision of the United Nations to help victims of a human rights violation. This council must have authority um, to make recommendation to the king and to the government and to provide financial, uh, physiological, medical, social compens compensation to victims uh, of a human rights violation. That's the mandate. Also, of the, their, their mandate is should be responsible for the implementation of recommendation of Bahrain uh, Commission of Inquiry regarding the human rights violation that acquired in 2011, also to ensure the reform of judiciary and supreme judicial and council and make them independent, because the case they are not independent. The state council also uh, must form a super uh, supreme court separate from the supreme judicial council and form the Ministry of Justice to protect the constitution, which will serve. Uh, I reference both, I mean, like gov I mean, government and also citizens. So the state council would have authority to raise recommendation again, uh, to amend laws that are in violation with international law. Finally, Bahrain also need to, uh, needs a body that implement uh, physiological rehabilitation programs before and after releasing uh, prisoner subjected especially to torture during their arrest while serving prison sentence and reintegrating into society because all what we have been witness in the last few years, all of them, all victim of torture were released without any program. And, and that's the problem. So I have many other points, but let's leave it to the discussion uh, if that's okay. Otherwise I can make them now. Listen, that's perfect. You, uh, Said Yusuf, you were you were bang on ten minutes, uh, which is great. Um, what it really was, it seems to me, is um, on the one hand, it was a checklist of of desires and wishes. At the same time, it seems to be a vision of what human rights could be in the country. I guess we'll save it for the discussion. But the two things that I I noticed in your in your presentation is that you addressed two issues regarding restitution, but not one particular one for accountability. But maybe that's something that we, we, will, we will come back to. I want to turn to Hassan Sarhan. Uh, Hassan, I need to find you on my phone if I can see you. There you are. Yeah. Can you see us, hear us? Are you, you're unmuted? Yes, yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. That's okay. great. I introduced you at the beginning as a as a as an attorney at uh, GMB Attorneys. Um, I'll give you ten minutes. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, okay. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank the organizer of this workshop for providing this opportunity. I hope it will contribute in opening uh, the door for constructive dialogue between all political parties in Bahrain, including the regime. On the other hand, the written paper is somewhat technical, so the reader who is not specialized in law may suffer uh, some difficulties in understanding all of its aspects. Also, the short presentation time for each speaker makes uh, summarizing the paper a must. I will try in this presentation to facilitate and simplify the language of the written document uh, to serve its purpose and to uh, stick to the time. And, and if I omitted any um, part of the paper, I would try my best to make up during the subsequent dialogue. Uh, first of all, uh, it should be noted that some of the terms or definitions the research paper talks about needs to be clarified. Uh, when I mentioned the law of political isolation, I meant several interrelated laws, uh, and they are in particular uh, law number uh, uh, 
uh, 25 of 2018, amend, amending Article 13 of Declared Law Number 14 for the year 2002 regarding exercising political uh, rights, and uh, which was issued on the 10th of August 2018, and uh, Law Number 21 for the year 1989, uh, the Law of Societies, Social and uh, Cultural uh, Clubs. And law number 26 for the year 2005 regarding political societies and their amendment. The first idea discussed by the paper is that law number 25 for the year 2018 uh, contradicts with the constitutional text. The law added two new prohibition from running to council. Uh, first, uh, the actual leaders of member uh, and member of political society dissolved by final judgment for violating the provision of constitution or any, any of its laws. And the second one, anyone who willfully harms or dispute the function of the constitutional or parliamental, uh, parliamentary life by terminating or leaving uh, the parliamentary work in the council or whose uh, membership has been revoked for the same reason. Anyone uh, to whom uh, the previous article applies is prohibited from running for elected council. The government applied it uh, retroactively, banning all members of political society that had been dissolved according to court ruling before the amendment was issued, such as uh, National Democratic Action Society, WAD, which I was a political bureau member in it, and uh, Al Wafaq National uh, Islamic Society. Both of them were dissolved before the amendment was issued. Uh, the main problem in this, it, it uh, it is, is its conflict with the text of Article 20 of the Constitution. It's the, this article established that there, uh, there is no crime or punishment except on the basis of law, and there is no punishment for any act except after the issuance of the law cr uh, criminalizing the act. Even though the law did not specify what crime requires banning members of the dissolved association from running uh, for the elected council, but at the same time, the law deprived them from the right and imposed on them the penalty of being barred from running to office, even though that uh, penalty was approved later after the judgment were issued. This principle uh, established in the constitution is called the principle of legitimacy. Thus, the, uh, the law of political isolation was clearly uh, contrary to the principle of legitimacy, which was built to protect justice from what has suffered in the past uh, centuries. Uh, its main objective is to show people what things are forbidden before they are punished for them, uh, which the political isolation law did not clarify, is uh, the forbidden act joining a political association or taking the decision that led to the dissolution. Uh, but in all cases, everyone was punished with a humiliating punishment and apply retroactively. In addition, uh, the law violated the text of Article 30 of the Constitution, which states that issue uh, that issued laws must be uh, promulgated by law and should not violate the essence of right or freedom. We uh, conclude that uh, the purpose of the law is to take revenge on political opponent and keep them away from the political scene. In addition, the law was applied mainly in violation even for other laws, law number uh, number 21 for the year 1989 regarding civil association. My colleague uh, has mentioned it stipulates that the member of board of director must enjoy all his civil and political rights. And the law on exercising political rights stipulate that the political rights enjoyed by Bahraini citizens are only two, suppressing opinion in every referendum conducted in according with the provision of the constitution. And the second one was electing members of the House of Representatives. Thus, candidacy, for the elected council is not a political right by this law, although it is an international established legal right as a political right. Bahraini law didn't state that, uh, thus, even those prevented from running to the elected council for any reason still enjoy the two rights stipulated in the law of exercising political right, which means that they are they have uh, full political and civil rights. However, uh, the government expanded uh, the application of political isolation law relation for the political opponents. So uh, it prevented their candidacy for membership in the board of director of any civil right, uh, 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 sorry, uh, any civil society and institution because they do not enjoy political rights. Although the matter is straightforward, not to mentioned that they prevented several seminars, including the one was uh, supposed to be held yesterday by Ibrahim Sharif uh, and al Khomi Association, and meeting with uh, uh, members of this association with the same excuse. Uh, this also confirmed that in addition to the fact that uh, 
uh, the law are unconstitutional, their application is also illegal. The basis of the, uh, for this is that the law determined the right despite its shortcoming. The law did not establish candidacy as a political right. Still, it regulates in other article the same right, such as those uh, stipulated above, by preventing member of political society from running as well as specified in the, uh, in the Constitution. Uh, article first article of the law on the exercising political right contradicts with the constitution because it does not stipulate the candidacy for uh, the elected council as a natural political right in violation of the constitution. Uh, the law also violated an original constitution and legal principle rep uh, represented in the personality of the punishment. A person may only be punished for a crime he committed, which means that. Uh, he committed an act in violation of the law. As mentioned, this requires that he has committed an act that is considered a crime by a law. And joining a member, uh, joining the membership of the association is not a crime. Uh, at the same time, the political isolation law punished all those who belong to in another conflict with the provision of the constitution and the established legal uh, rules. Uh, suppose the dissolve of an association was due to statement or an invent invention, for example, uh, invitation for a march or any other reason, whoever issued the statement are called uh, or called for the march uh, to, uh, to apply the principle of personal punishment is the one who should be prevented. It is not manageable, uh, imaginable that a person will be punished for an act committed by another person. Uh, this uh, is the Bahrain government implementation, even to the people who have moved away from the association and distanced themselves perhaps a decade ago before the law was issued. Uh, the last part of the paper presented I present the issue of Bahraini government application of the law and its inter inter interpretation of it. Uh, it is common knowledge that any decision issued by a government called an administrative decision must aim to public interest. It is not permissible for the decision to be uh, uh, to relate against the government's opponent. Uh, what is certain is that the government has interrupted the law to implement it with an intent of uh, taking revenge of political opponent. It is uh, forbid it, it forbids uh, members of political society from any civil action or talk in politics in a way that clear that the intention uh, uh, and uh, moves the administrative decision uh, away from the, the supposed basis uh, for it, which is uh, seeking a public interest. Uh, this is a pre briefly uh, what was stated in the research paper, and I hope that I was within the time frame. And many thanks again for all of the organization, uh, organizers and attendees. Hassan, thank you very much. You are one minute and 21 seconds within time. You're the shortest so far. Thank you so much. Hassan, I, again, we'll save it to the conversation later, but I know that the Bahraini human rights, uh, political rights discourse refers to the law on political isolation in respect to the law on political rights. I know that uh, some people from the UN at least were tuning in, were taking part of this um, event earlier tonight. I, 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 for one, just really, really want to see us as, a, as an organization and maybe and perhaps with others to collate what you have just said to us and put it to the special rapporteur on the rights of freedom of uh, peaceful assembly and association. He's a, he's a great special rapporteur. Um, this is a Clement Nialetosi, um, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly or more or less. He's, he's really great. And I think we should try and pull that together at some point. Uh, uh, now I've taken time. Let's move to, because I saw that Jalal uh, Feruz also wanted to have, uh, have a word. But last, certainly not least, Fatima. Fatima Yazbek, uh, are you there? Yes, um, I'm here. Great. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, my internet connection yes. is not so good, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Salam and everyone involved in organizing this very important seminar. My paper tonight or today will be about uh, the standards of the political reforms in Bahrain. One of the most important reasons that ignited the sparks of the peaceful pro-democracy protests, which started on 14th of February 2011, was the government's firm grip on power by manipulating laws and regulations. 
For years, the Bahraini government have used the strategy of divide and rule to maintain its grip on power, creating and fueling the division between the Sunni and the Shia citizens, um, because that guarantees the lack of a strong base of a cross-sectarian opposition that will unite the citizens regardless of their sects and unite, the, and unite their demands. Thus, putting the authorities under real pressure to maintain the grip on power they have had for decades. When the people took to the streets on 14th of February 2011, the authorities saw it as a real threat to the sectarian strategy they have been using because it wasn't only Shia citizens uh, who were protesting. There were Bahrainis from all sects, from all religions, and from all affiliations. They were demanding the right. And this explains the brutal way that was used to disperse the protests since the very first uh, days. Uh, the peaceful protests were faced by excessive use of force, including firing live bullets on the protesters, arresting them, torturing them, and committing serious violations, trying to put off the, the first spark of the protests and creating an atmosphere of fear so the citizens won't participate in any further protest. This strategy was proved wrong because the brutal practices of the authorities were only fueling the protests even more and pushing people to take to the streets more. Bahraini people have been fighting for democracy and rights continuously for more than 10 years. Uh, however, Bahrain's authorities have not spared any tool trying to put off the opposition movement. They took the advantage of the protests against the kingdom's policies, uh, tightened the security group even more, and controlled every single department in the country. Opponents, political activists, um, social media activists, journalists, human rights advocates, and even the people who participate in any kind of protest and their families are a possible target of the authorities. They are faced by various kinds of violations, including, but not limited to, unfair trials, uh, lengthy and harsh prison sentences, illegal arbitrary detention, enforced disappearance, um, torture, strippi stripping of citizenships, etc. So political reform is the very first essential st step to build a strong base to achieve justice and democracy in the country. But what are the standards of political reforms, reform in Bahrain? Uh, number one, Bahrain's justice system does not guarantee achieving justice for all people, as it is used as another tool to punish the opposition. Most of the senior judges are, member or are members of Bahrain's royal family, or they are non-Bahraini, hired with two years contracts, and they are forced to issue sentences that comply with the government's strategies, views, and opinions to renew their contracts. Lack of transparency is the perfect description of Bahrain's judiciary, especially in the cases which have political motives or in the charges uh, which are based on the Terrorism Act. Bahrain's judicial authorities does not guarantee the international standards for, of, uh, for, for, for fair trials. Actually, they issue statements following the trials which violated these standards. Um, the political authorities control the court's sentences and international organizations consider Bahrain's judiciary politicized. So we can say that uh, the judicial reform is a crucial step to achieve political reform in the country. It is a very significant pre-foundation step to maintain an independent judiciary, which is the base of a strong state which respects the rule of law, including uh, prosecuting the perpetrators and those responsible for the crimes and violations and holding them accountable to avoid impunity. Transition, number two, transitional justice is a very important aspect to achieve national reconciliation, including reparation and compensations for the victims and their families. Transitional ju justice cannot be achieved totally without prosecuting the perpetrators of the violations and crimes, which um, the government in Bahrain and the Bahraini authorities, like uh, they encourage impunity. They don't stand uh, against impunity and the officials who agitated these practices. The protection given to the security members in Bahrain incited an atmosphere of impunity, which is a great barrier against national reconciliation. 
Number three, reshaping and reforming institutions, especially uh, the repressive ones like the National Security Agency to avoid recommitting the same violations and inhuman crime. This is very important to enhance the trust between the citizens and the state, empower the rule of law, grant the citizens a feeling of certainty of protection and safety inside the country, and guarantee that the violations that they faced before won't be tolerated anymore. Number four, number four conducting investigations or forming a com commissions of inquiry regarding the committed violations to draw conclusions, recommendations, and amendments. This step help, uh, helps in projecting on the experience and allows the authorities as well as the population to overcome what was committed in the past and work hard towards a better future for everyone. The last point is national dialogue, which is a crucial step towards national reconciliation. And it is a comprehensive uh, uh, national reconciliation and comprehensive political reform. Um, national dialogue is very important and powerful in conflict resolution and political transformation. It can broaden debate regarding a country's trajectory beyond the usual elite decision makers, if used correctly. Bahrain's opposition represents a huge and important segment of the population. Their views and opinions are, and even their proposed strategies are as important as the government and decision makers it use. Um, thank you very much. And I hope that I didn't exceed my time. Fatima, you're perfect. Uh, well within time, thank you so much. Just to remind everyone where we're at. Um, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone who's, who's spoken so far. Jalal Fairuz wanted to make a quick um, intervention, which is, is perfectly fine. Um, just to say to everyone, uh, kind of remind you, of course, the papers will be on the Salam website, but also our colleague, Dr. Andrew McIntosh, will present a kind of summing up of what we have been discussing. And I wanted also to flag that uh, I think it was Badr al Nuaimi wanted to make some comments on, or questions, I think, on, uh, on Ghassan's uh, paper. Uh, Jalal, are you able to access? Uh, yes, yes. Do you hear my voice? Great. Okay. Yes, I do. We do hear your voice. Please, just uh, you wanted to make an intervention, just a couple minutes if you would, because we wanted to allow a little bit of time for questions. We have got half an hour left. Right. Uh, but we want to give, 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 give Andrew a bit of time for summing up. Over, right. over, over to you, uh, uh, Jalal. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Drury, very much. Uh, actually, um, I was just to, to emphasize what uh, uh, bah where Bahrain stands in regards of, to the uh, principles of good governance, uh, as the United Nations uh, uh, puts it uh, in, in seven categories, the equity, the equality, of course, the, the, the uh, participation, pluralism, uh, transparency, accountability, rule of law, and principles of democracy. Of course, in, in terms of the e equality, you could see how uh, un unequal is, is the Bahrain uh, the the uh, royal family is 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 on top of everything, and they are controlling everything. Imagine that they are they are controlling uh, fifty percent of the of the cabinet and uh, sixty percent of the high ranks in the government, and not to mention, of course, discriminations uh, uh, against several uh, uh, factors of Bahrain society. In terms of uh, participation, you could see how. Uh, it's blocked from uh, from from be uh, having the people of Bahrain to participate. We do, you don't we don't have uh, a, a real democracy, a real uh, parliament in Bahrain. Uh, of course, the the main uh, political societies are have been banned, and all some of uh, my colleagues have have spoken spoken about that. Uh, going to the pluralism. Of course, the, the, there's no chance to, to have pluralism in Bahrain. It's all in the hand of the royal family. And that's, that's the, the biggest problem uh, against the democracy in Bahrain. In terms of transparency, Bahrain is out of transparency. Bahrain is, is ranked uh, as number 50 out of uh, around 150. And, and it is, it is uh, considered as untransparent. Uh, in, in, in terms of the uh, House of Freedom uh, uh, categorization. 
in terms of accountability, you could see that uh, all the, the torturers, uh, neither one of them have been brought to justice and uh, uh, investigations have not been very vital into the killing of the activists uh, under torture in, in jail. Uh, the, uh, in, in terms of rule of law, there is nothing called real uh, law in Bahrain. Uh, the, you, you could see that it is, uh, it is uh, uh, whatever comes to the, whatever the, the royal family wants, that will be the law uh, on just not mentioning. Uh, in terms of the principles of democracy, Bahrain, of course, the, the International Democracy Index ranks Bahrain as number 146 out of 167 countries. Almost, almost nothing. It's it's in Bahrain. It was uh, three was given a rank of three point fifty three in two thousand and six. In two thousand and sixteen, it went to only two point seven nine. And of course, uh, the European uh, Union uh, uh, mentioned that Bahrain is is beyond anything uh, regarding democracy. So there are lots of things which needs to be in, improved in Bahrain to bring it up to, to being a good government. And, and, and the, of course, the, only, the first step will be re reconciliation, a legitimate uh, dialogue between the government and the opposition. Thank you, Dori, for, for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Joel. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, Badr, if you can bear with us, um, I would like to hand it over to Andrew McIntosh, Dr. Andrew McIntosh, our colleague, if you are ready, because I'm looking at this on my phone, I don't necessarily see everyone's image. Andrew, are you there and can you hear us? Uh, yes, Drury, I am here. Great, okay, terrific. Are, would you be happy to do a summing up now or would you like to take whatever questions? Because Badr al Amy wanted to ask something about Ghassan's uh, paper, but would you be happy to do a kind of summing up now? Certainly, I would be happy to. Great. I think that one of the main things that we can really take away from this talk is we've had a very brutal meditation, I think, over the past few hours of wondering not just about the, the course of reform in Bahrain, but whether reform itself is possible. And we've been forced to have some very difficult conversations on that. We've explored the geopolitical uh, consequences of this, the fact that Bahrain is a terminus for so many important world powers, whether it's the United States, uh, whether it is because of its adjacency to labor from India due to power struggles between Saudi Arabia and Iran, as well as its financial dependence on uh, other parts of the GCC. All of these things make reform difficult in Bahrain. As, and that isn't even with the, when it comes to talking about the impunity of the institutions there, which as we've seen can suppress other institutions at will, whether it's for women's empowerment, whether it's for political societies, whether it's for uh, sectarian reasons. As I, these are all direct barriers in which people have means in which the, to have popular recourse in society. And it's like the very things that we hold to be treasured in any free society. Some of this is due to design from the constitution as we have seen, but as we've seen, it also has to do with fundamental negotiations of the social contract uh, that exists uh, within Bahrain. As it has been mentioned, Bahrain is less a rule of law state as it is a rule by law state, as I, in which the authority of those in power is nearly absolute and that they can change the laws at will or simply ignore them if they feel compelled to. That however, also builds into the fact that much of society has been forced into a sort of apathy on much of these issues where many people have been forced as like to accept this rule as the inevitability of society. That is one of the things that we inherently reject when we talk about uh, how we can improve and how we can reform. Whether it is merely the constitution as like, and how it is limited laws there, or by the fact that laws are not applied evenly. One of the things that unites everyone in this room and everyone who has attended here is our refusal to capitulate as a, and our desire to see a better future in Bahrain. This manifests in multiple ways of what we've discussed whether it's through Alafak's eight point plan, whether it's through individuals such as Ibrahim Sharif, as like who continues to uh, his struggle politically from Bahrain. It all has to do with the immense and extremely influential international campaigns that aid 
in amplifying the voices of Bahrainis and the diaspora, whether they are in the diaspora or whether they are reporting from Bahrain themselves. And that commitment to human rights can be heard from anywhere in the world thanks to these channels. And it's like despite immense uh, efforts to silence them. One of the things that I hope that everyone can take away from these meetings is even though that we have monumental obstacles in our way, as like one thing that constantly occurs in time is that obstacles can be moved away, even if it is gradually. As something that has been said for many who have protested in countries such as Hong Kong, the Chinese uh, statement, be water, means specifically what we are confronted with today. It is our flexibility as like that ultimately overcomes obstacles, as well as our ability to get around them, whether it is through a deluge that can occur through a massive social movement or through the gradual erosion of barriers that we see that carves mountains. Is that we are water, and one of the things that we hope to do is eventually shape the uh, Bahrain in a way that can make it a freer, more just, and more equal society. Let's say, let's say wrapping up is more than a, a, a call to arms or a call to peaceful arms. I uh, think is where everyone was going. Thank you very much, um, Andrew. That's uh, as sobering as was the earlier contributions. Badr uh, al Naimi, you had a question. I don't know if you're able to speak, though. Are you able to unmute and ask your question? Or is it something, I mean, because I'm not sure I can unmute you myself. Otherwise, could you put the question in the text? Given that he's silent, may indicate that he's not able to unmute. I add him Hello? as the panelist, so now he can speak. Oh, yes, great. go ahead. Hello. Hello. Great. Hi. Um, so I, I just, if I if I can have two minutes, I wanted to add a comment on 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 Mr. Hassan's. Uh, paper regarding uh, the trajectory of revocation of political rights in, in Bahrain. Uh, if I have the time now or later, uh, I don't... Uh, no, no, now, now, now. Okay. We, we, um, we've got about 15 minutes left, and I, if you could just do could take a couple minutes okay. max, that would be great. Sure, sure. Um, so I just wanted to thank uh, Rassan for the excellent paper. I think you captured very well the contradictions that are always... Uh, present and purposefully designed uh, within Bahrain's uh, legal framework. Uh, I just wanted to add to the discussion of, of the idea of replication of political rights by also drawing attention to the political changes that were made in uh, 2014 uh, to local municipal council elections. Uh, before 2014, uh, the Manama Municipal uh, Council, uh, like other municipal councils across the country, was a directly elected uh, municipal body within the same electoral districts that people were electing uh, uh, representatives in the parliament. So, so this particularly, especially because also the elections for municipal uh, councils happened on the same day and on the same uh, uh, voting ballot as uh, parliamentary elections. Uh, the campaigns were done at the same time as well, uh, these two elections and these two bodies were inextricably linked, at least politically, uh, and from a practical uh, standpoint, uh, especially given that they were also introduced as part of the same reform package in, in 2002. But uh, after 2014, the Manama Council was dissolved and it was replaced uh, through an amendment to the municipalities law uh, by a wholly appointed uh, uh, Manama uh, council. Um, and, and because of the controversy surrounding this, uh, this was one of the few uh, occasions where uh, the constitutional court uh, actually issued a ruling uh, on a political issue. Uh, the court uh, ruled that because the constitution did not specify the exact mechanism by which the municipal councils are formed or elected, and also that the political rights law uh, specifically defined uh, political rights as um, a voting and running for office uh, uh, in the parliament. Uh, 
then that means that the uh, dissolution and replacement of the Manama Municipal Council does not violate the constitution. And this is one of the issues in the sense, like what Hassan was saying, is that uh, the constitution says one thing, of course, and the law says another, but this is obviously by design because they never intended for these things to actually uh, you know, build uh, any kind of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, political rights over time. Uh, uh, and even though it's not completely unheard of for the council's local uh, municipal council uh, to take a different form than other areas of the country and in, in, in many countries across the world, but typically the difference is, you know, you, ex you would expect that the, it goes into the trajectory of uh, um, having more freedoms, more rights, more democratic accountability, for uh, uh, the capital council, but the situation in Bahrain is that uh, the, this, this uh, change has diminished democratic accountability because legally, uh, you what you understand from the law and the design of the new council is that they are appointed oh. they are appointed by royal decree, and uh, the members of the Manama Council cannot resign before the king formally accepts the resignation. Uh, which indicates that their accountability is is primarily to the king and not to the local citizens that they, uh, at least in principle, are supposed to be uh, representing. And this is another one of those situations where they bake in uh, uh, loopholes in the law so that 10, 15, 20 years afterwards, they can come back and, and revisit and uh, and change, while also at the same time without creating that uh, uh, constitutional contradiction. Of course, in, in Ghassan's paper, he was explaining how sometimes these changes create new constitutional contradictions. But in this uh, particular case in 2014, it was done in such a way that um, uh, it was a, a very easy uh, change uh, to make. And thank you. Thanks, Badr. Uh, look, just again to to, to you and to uh, to Hassan and, and and maybe ourselves. In fact, I really feel really strongly that this that that the issues contained within that law, which are not just contradictory, not just creating contradictions within the the constitution, but are actually fundamentally op opposed to international human rights standards. I'd love to see it. Uh, made into a formal submission slash paper uh, to the special rapporteur on um, on on freedom of uh, association and assembly. Um, can you see a question put in the in the in the chat box from uh, Rabab? Can people see that question? I'm, I'm not clear to whom Rabab is directing the question. Um, I kind of have gone back into the chat and asked him that. Um, but for those who have not seen it, it says from Rabab Taki, what's the future of implementing of political right of Bahraini people in regard to the geopolitical and internal changes? If the opposition participates in the government, will it be allowed to activate the political right at the applied level? If the problem in Bahrain lies in the extent of the official implementation of the constitution, the rights contained therein, then where is the seriousness, seriousness of the actual work to activate political right, or, or what is the, the role of, and what is the role of the government opposition, and so on? I think a lot of this was was touched on in uh, in 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 our in our discussion. Does anyone in particular want to come back to that? Because I I certainly have my own negative views on that question. Drawery, we have Ali. Ali's Aswad raises his hand. Oh, okay, good. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm looking at this on my phone, so I can't see it. Thanks, Joad. Ali, pl please, please comment. Uh, yes, uh, Drawery. I mean, I have this. Uh, maybe I can, I can summarize these uh, questions or points in the part of implementation, where we call it a roadmap to democracy, where we can have opposition, government, international community all together. Uh, implementing these uh, these reforms, 
But we think in March in 2011, the Crown Prince himself, he talks about it or whatever he raised it. And also some international uh, bodies like BICI, Sharif Bassouni, uh, he did uh, talk about it where the people in Bahrain, yeah. they all of them in, in one vote will be the final uh, arbiters. So I think when we are in this, we, we see this is as a direct re uh, reference to the necessity of referendum in uh, deciding the future reforms of Bahrain. So we wholly support this idea. Um, being in the government, uh, the part of uh, opposition, implementing BICI, implementing all the recommendations by Geneva, uh, having this reform plan, it could move, it could take us to say, I would say here from uh, point A to point B and then C, D until we reach uh, to this long journey. But I would like to see here, we have some general process where we believe in Al-Wufaq also like the dialogue is something as an immediate dialogue should begin to discuss and negotiate the reform proposals. I mean, this should in involve representative of opposition, the government, the royal family and other stakeholders. And there should be equal standing for each group in the discussions also. Number two is the new constitution where we think also a new constitution must be drawn based on the direct recommendations of the dialogue. The dialogue should not advise this constitution, but instead direct this uh, constitution, I would say here. Maybe number three, the last things here where we have to give legitimacy to all of these, the dialogue and the uh, constitution, we should have popular acceptance. I mean, we are most in favor of universal referendum to accept this, the new constitution. And if this is not possible, then a directly elected constitution simply can approve. And uh, we think uh, all together, all of these uh, uh, things as a components, if we take them all in a platform, then we can have, I would say here, a vehicle on the right track where it takes everybody else you know, and including the international community, including all the activists, political, uh, bringing all these political rights and, uh, you know, implementation of uh, Biki uh, recommendation and other stuff could be, uh, could be, I mean, you can, we can, we can see it. So the problem in Bahrain, yes, it is, it is long, long, long history. I share also the views from the first session with with uh, our friend Nicolo, like it won't be too difficult if there is a will from both from both parties. Now the party of opposition or party of Bahraini is there. The will from them is there. Uh, they want a new constitution. They want to protect their rights. They want to take all of these, you know, based on equal, based on win-win situation here. The, the 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 rejection list is the governments now or the ruling family taking this as a serious. We will see. The international community should play a mediation role and we don't need any more facilitation. I don't think we need someone who can talk to us about maybe, so this is right, this is wrong. There's nothing completely 100% right and nothing 100% wrong apart from human rights abuses, like a stop torture. Bahrain doesn't need any uh, experts from international community to talk to them about stopping torture. Maybe they need someone to talk to them about how to have a country stable to stabilize the country for the future, to read what's in, 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 a, in a young or new generation's mind where they think this is how, do, how would like to see Bahrain in the near future without having another economic crisis, another human rights crisis, another political crisis where everyone else has struggled. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ali, that's really helpful. Um... A lot, of, a lot to follow up. And there's a few more comments in the chat, but but I noticed that um, Jawad wanted to make a uh, quick comment. And we have about six minutes left. Um, so Jawad, over to you quickly, and I'll just have a look what's in the chat. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, I can summarize it. Uh, the issue is related to the unwillingness of the ruling family in Bahrain to adopt uh, reforms. It is unfortunately, uh, there is no political will within the ruling family. I know many excuses why them said uh, to the geopolitics of the area and so on, or what's 
uh, uh, Saudis or UAE's uh, wishes are there that they shouldn't be a little bit more reformist, but I think it is that these are more excused than uh, realistic issues. I myself, I heard it from the king when we met with him during uh, our uh, parliamentary uh, role. Um, he clearly indicated that when he adopted reforms in, in 2001, he said uh, to us that it's been rejected by Saudi Arabia, it's been rejected by the neighborhood, but he insisted that to adapt that reform and he gone ahead with it during that time, as he said. So here the question comes, why you shouldn't have a new version of his reform if that, that was as a, as, as a reform. As we can see that many uh, strategical issues that uh, uh, the authorities used to claim that it is obstacle to reforms almost been removed. So what makes the, 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 the ruling family don't adopt that reforms yet? Uh, uh, and, and let me say here, there won't be any type of the human rights reforms as a genuine one, as a deep one, as a rooted one, without having political reforms. And at the same time, if anyone wants the uh, permanent stability and security of Bahrain, for sure should have that much of the visions toward a serious reforms. Uh, we believe that uh, without a genuine reforms, continuous political reforms based on the human rights issue, which can uh, lead to the sustainable developments in general, will not lead the country toward any type of the stability and security. And once again, as Bassouni indicated in his uh, latest uh, time, the, the, the ruling family should decide, do they want the unity of the family or unity of the nation? Do they want the, the interests of the nation or interests of the membering family within the Al-Khalifa family? Thank you. Thanks, George. We, we are very close to being out of time. A um, few other exchanges in the, in the text there between Ali and, and uh, Rabab. Really good questions. And I, I've, I've put in the chat as well, uh, Badr and indeed others, if you have any other views that I think we'd, we'd really like to capture, please do email them to me and to us. Uh, I'll put the email in the chat. Um, or certainly we'll share it with our colleagues. Like I said at the very beginning, um, <laughs> uh, this will be captured on the Salam for Democracy and Human Rights uh, website. Um, we'll either in the form of a report or individual, individual papers, and we'll try to capture uh, some of the discussion as well, the questions that some of you have put and some of the things that we've touched on. Uh, I think there's a lot more to be done. This was pretty sobering. Um, if there's any other questions in the chat, I'm not able to see them, and I'm minded now to wrap up as it's, as it's uh, we've got two minutes left. Tara, any... Tara, raise her hand. Her hand Tara. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Joao. Sorry, because it's on my phone, okay. so not, I don't see all the pictures. <clears throat> I'm just going to say something here, and it will be my closing um, moment. And again, I'm actually going to quote uh, Sheikh Ali uh, because he said exactly what Jawad has just said there. It is neither acceptable nor logical to refuse reformative demands by justifying that there are worse cases than ours. Granting public freedoms should not be rejected under the pretext that other countries do not grant such freedoms. Now, I really think, I believe that Bahrain can be a beacon of light for people in the region and for us to look to from outside. And I believe that Jawad and Sheikh Ali echo each other's words in hopes for that freedom. And really, I appeal personally to the royal family also to consider their conscience and really examine their methods and listen to the people. And again, I will say out loud, please release the political prisoners and involve them in democratic moves towards a united Bahrain. Thank you. Yeah, what better way to, to end. Um, listen, everyone, thanks so much. It's, uh, it's 29 minutes past the hour. We're supposed to finish it uh, at half past the hour. Um, I think this is a good moment to, to wrap up. It's been absolutely lovely seeing you all again. Um, Jalal, if you're still there, Ali, um, as again, I'm, I'm watching this on my phone, so I don't see all the images, but it was really, really great. It's a great conversation. Um, again, just the sobering and, and, and uh, uh, a bit disheartening, but also at the same time, a little bit uplifting. Tara, Tara is always there to offer us a, 
uh, a glimpse of what could be, what can be if we put our minds to it. Uh, thanks. Um, Badr, please, uh, yeah, Badr, I see your, your, your message is coming up in the text. Do, do send me along an email. I, 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 I've not met you before. Uh, it'd be great to, to be in touch and, um, and we'll take it from there. Any other final burning things in this last minute before we go? Uh, may I may I have just a short word, uh, Tori? Mm. Uh, right. Uh, Bahrain's uh, uh, main uh, issue is, is not only a human rights issue. It is a democracy issue. The, the human rights violations were consequences of the, uh, uh, the activists going out and protesting. And uh, if we don't tackle the democracy issue, we won't be getting to anywhere. That's exactly what uh, uh, Sheikh Ali Salman was, was saying and Tara was referring to. Yeah. So the, the main, uh, uh, we have to, to, to try and, and put forward what is good for the royal family, what is good for everyone to uh, go for a legitimate democracy reformation in, in Bahrain. Thank you, thank you, Drori again. Thanks, Shalom. Uh, Rory, say, say, say a Yusuf, he's raised his hand uh, maybe before you end up, give him your. Yep. Yeah. So, Yusuf, quick, quick. Yes, so I just would like to say that, yes, so uh, uh, what really needs is that uh, to change the, pract uh, the practice. So, when it comes to laws, for example, we have a law that prohibits torture, but the torture is ongoing in Bahrain, and we have seen many reports by international organizations documented the torture. So, so, again, it's not a matter of problem of, uh, I mean, of a law. Yes, we demand that laws uh, in Bahrain in comply with international standards, but I think, believe, it's still, we need we need to, to change. I mean, it's all about practice. So we have problem of the practicing the law and implementing the law. So we have to change the culture. We have, to, as Ibrahim Sharif said, we have to change the mindset uh, in order uh, to, to have a political will to make uh, uh, yeah, a human rights reform uh, uh, in Bahrain. And that's what you need. Look, so much more that could be said. Guys, thank you so, so much, everyone. Um, I think with this, uh, let's wrap it up. Uh, I, I hope um, people watching found it uh, useful and engaging, um, something a little bit fresh. Thanks everyone for for taking part, uh, contributing, asking questions. Um, thanks, Stacey, for the for the for round one. Uh, Luciano and uh, and, and Kazuto, thank you for your presentations. Everyone, thanks very much. Until next time, and uh, good night from from London. All right. Good thank night you. to all of you. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.